Hey, Dr. Lobo. Hey, I was just about to call you, so that's good. I'm glad you're here. Um, so they got the files and um, the list of files was similar to the ones that I had sent last year or something, the names? Exact same, yeah. I mean, one REU, I think one, two, three, through eight. Okay, good, that's all I need. Good. With some, some whatever Excellent naming. Stuff. Yeah. Hey, Tess, hey, Sunji. It's like summer camp, right? But on Zoom. You say your name's Sanjay, right? Not is it Sun or Sun? It's Sun. That's right. Sun. Sun. Sanjay. Sanjay, which is very interesting because um, so I have no idea how these names come about in life, but I know that. Uh, 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 did you ever hear of the name Mrs. Indira Gandhi? Did you ever hear that name? I have not. No. Okay. Did you ever hear the name uh, Nehru? No. Okay. So it turns out this guy, Nehru, was the prime minister of India during its independence from Britain, 1908, whatever, 47 or something like that. And then uh, later on, his daughter, Mrs. Indira Gandhi, not any relationship to the other Gandhi, who was a famous guy because he, you know, he helped peacefully free India or whatever. Uh, but anyway, so Mrs. Indira Gandhi, um, she became the prime minister later on, like a few years later. Then she had a son whose name was Sanjay, exactly the way you say your name, <laughs> but it's an Indian name and it's spelled S-U-N-J-A-Y, Sanjay. I see. That's S -U -N -J -A -Y. Funny. So when you said it yesterday, because you know, whenever I encounter a, a, new, a new name, I try to think what it sounds like so that I can remember it easily. Right? Um, so in your case, it was easy to remember that it sounded like that. <laughs> but anyway, I'm sure it has probably no connection, but who knows, you know. As I said, life is complicated. I found out weird things about languages and all that. Yeah, but that spelling can go either way. Because I've known, I've known like Koreans and Chinese, like some Koreans that had, that were Sun, and then I've known some Chinese that were Sun. With the same spelling, same spelling, Robert? Different spelling. Okay, so yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, no. yeah, okay, well, whatever. I mean, it's just an interesting observation. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Good morning. Yeah, guys, don't forget to put your numbers on too. So, do they have to do it each time, Robert? It doesn't have a way to just set it permanently. Um, I don't think I don't think so. No, I think they have to do it each time. Wow, that's scary. Well, maybe they do. I don't know. Well, so Robert, let me just when I set mine, it uh, asked me if I wanted to keep it yeah. each time I joined. And I said, okay. yes. Okay. So it, yeah. it keeps mine every time I join. So Robert, uh, uh, let me just call you uh, offline for a moment, okay? Sure.
Hey, Robert, can you add your number to your, uh, thanks. And I think that's, yeah, this whole numbering thing, it's, uh, let me see here, is it okay if I can? We're waiting for one more person, right? Uh, yes, I'm reading a chat right now. Um, Dr. Lobo, Brian wants to know, is it okay if he keeps his camera off? For yeah, 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 that should be fine. That should be okay. okay. But I just want you to know, uh, we're missing one other person. Is that right? Yeah, so we have one, two, three, four. I think we're missing five. And number five is Chu Chen. And then is there a missing number nine? I don't, oh yeah, number nine is here. Okay, Ethan's just stepped up. Okay, good. Yeah, the reason I put everyone, I got, I have everyone with numbers is because it yeah. got so overwhelming. Yeah, to keep track of people, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm really yeah, tell, this, telling the yeah, students, of course. Way, I, this way it's easy because when I do it by participants, it just lists them in order of the numbers anyway. So. Yeah. So I can easily find out who's missing. Yeah, so you guys don't feel offended that I've given you a number. You're more than a number to me, don't worry. <laughs> okay, so we'll begin in about a minute. Uh, did you have a way to contact uh, the missing student or anything, or you want to just call her and see? Yeah, give me, give me a second, I'll call her. Okay. Okay, so let me um, go ahead and get started then um, while we wait for the new last person to come on. But I'm gonna go ahead and uh, get started. So first of all, uh, let me welcome you all to the second day of the REU. Um, I'm assuming yesterday went mostly smoothly for everybody. If there was any issues, you should let us know soon, okay? Meaning either you're not able to follow the lecture notes of Dr. Shah or whatever else might've happened, right? Um, so, Assuming that you're more or less keeping up with things, don't, it doesn't have to be perfect, but it cannot be so far lost behind that you have no clue what's going on. Um, so uh, assuming that you're more or less okay, uh, which by the way, just a point about that, if you find yourself getting stuck with something and you're really lost, as I said yesterday, it's important to let us know sooner rather than later, okay? I Meaning you don't wanna wait the whole evening and let us know the next morning. You wanna let us know an hour or so after you have the problem, right? So that we can catch you up and we don't waste, don't spend the time waiting for you to get caught up and for you to be able to catch up again, right? Okay, so just make sure that you understand that. So uh, if there's something that you don't understand, you should try to review it. These are all recorded, as you know. So you can look at the recordings and stuff to figure out what you don't know, right? And then you tell us, I don't understand that slide or that that position number in the recording, you know, that that time number in the recording. I don't understand what he was saying there or whatever, right? Okay, so that will be the plan, okay? So make sure that you follow that direction because in this game, unfortunately, there's no easy way to get lost. Once you're lost, you're lost. It's very hard to make a comeback if you get lost for too long, right? So it's very, very important that you let us know when you're struggling and we'll find a way in the downtime to get back with you to fix whatever it is that you're struggling with, okay? So just make sure that you do communicate with us when there's a problem. Um, so that's why I, I was saying that I'm assuming that Dr. Shah's lectures yesterday, you more or less understood what he's trying to do. Not a lot, because I know uh, maybe the way that he presents some of the details is not as detailed as I would present them, but um, you understood enough. So we're gonna build off of those ideas today. Uh, and so uh, just, just tell me yes or no, yesterday, 
in his lectures, did he talk about edge detection to you guys or not? He did, right? Uh, okay. Yes. Okay, and so you got some idea what edge detection is about. I'm going to repeat present it today, not the same topics that he presented yesterday, but a slightly different focus, okay? So let me firstly go ahead and share my screen with you. Uh, you can share. Okay, so can you all see something that, that says edge detection now? Yes. Okay, very good. And so then I'm gonna go ahead and move along uh, with that material. So, um, uh, so once again, then just to repeat, the purpose of edge detection is to find jumps in the brightness function of an image and to mark them, right? So for example, if this is your image, and we'll be using this image a lot today uh, for at least the first hour or so. Uh, and then we'll, we'll go on to other things. But um, so imagine this is the picture you're looking at and you wanna find the edges of this. Then the point is uh, you would ultimately like to have an output that looks something like this, okay? That would be the plan. That would be your goal, okay? So uh, what I'm doing in the next three quarters of an hour or so is not, ultimately that important to you, meaning it's unlikely that you're ever going to use it in the next you know, six months or whatever doing this kind of work, but who knows, okay? And I will tell you that 10 years ago, seven years ago, what I'm doing in the next half hour or so would have been extremely useful, okay? But it's just the way things are going right now. Uh, people are less focusing on that kind of thing, right? But the reason I'm doing it is because of, for historical reasons, I really want you to understand what convolution really is. Because once we get into, uh, into neural networks, it's heavily about convolution. And I want you to make sure that you understand, um, you know, first of all, what convolution is, what it used to be like 20, 30 years ago before neural networks took over in its approach to convolution. Um, so that's kind of why I'm doing this part as well, okay? Um, so then the point is that uh, what I showed you was what you would have had as your input. You'd like this to be your output. And so um, what we're really trying to do is to find jumps in the brightness function of an image and we wanna mark them, right? So now, before we go into details of how we would have designed a decent edge detector, I want to detour and talk about convolution, okay? And now again, uh, I want to, to qualify some of these comments about, uh, there's 10 students in your group, right? You're called a cohort of 10 students. And um, each one of you has come with a very, very different background to this process, right? So some of you might have taken a computer vision class before, uh, some of you have taken a machine learning class before, some of you have taken very little of either. And that's the way we want it to be, okay? Meaning we did not select you guys to all be perfectly ready to come and uh, say that you understand everything because you've already taken a computer vision class. That's the opposite. We wanted some of you to have that background and some of you not to have that background, some of you to be beginners and so on. So we spread it out, okay? in the skill level. So what I'm expecting today, as I go through the next few minutes, is that some of you will have seen this before and you'll think, oh my gosh, you know, why am I seeing this again? If you are in that situation, you can feel free to uh, zone out and do something else in the meantime. By something else, I don't mean some other topic, but you can go ahead and watch the videos that you should have been watching in the last two weeks and you didn't, right? So you can go and do some of that by just keeping an eye on what I'm doing if you're quite familiar with what I'm doing already. If on the other hand, you think it's new and you haven't seen it before, then you really should be paying de detailed attention to it. And definitely those of you who have never taken a class in this topic before or anything like it at all, should pay lots of attention to everything, okay? So, and as time goes on, I'll ask you guys who's in that situation that needed to watch everything versus who's in the situation that already has seen some of it before. So now I'll be talking about the concept of convolution. So the idea in convolution is that, uh, it's typically an operation between two tables of numbers and usually um, this kind of convolution. So again, I'm talking about the concept of 40 years ago convolution, right? 40 years ago, 50 years ago, what was convolution? Uh, you typically would have an image. And so the image I'm showing you here, this image over here uh, with the minus one, the plus one, the minus two, plus two, and so on. Uh, normally it wouldn't be the same size as the table, the second table, which is the table of weights, okay? It wouldn't be the same size, it would be much bigger because the image is normally, you know, whatever size you get from your cameras, right? Uh, but in this case, we're just showing you a very, very small example so that we can run through the calculation in an efficient amount of time, okay? So typically, if one table is smaller, then it is on the right of the operator, meaning um, it's the 
table that you're going to be applying, you're going to apply this table of weights to this image, okay? And the applying symbol is this, is the symbol of convolution. It's a star with a circle around it. And then the question is, is what is the answer you expect to get from that, right? Okay, so that's the whole story there. So uh, the way that you're supposed to do it uh, is that you're initially supposed to pad the left array with an ocean of zeros, okay? So what that means is that you take this array and you embed it within an ocean of zeros everywhere, large numbers of zeros everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. And then you have a little island of these four numbers here, right? Okay, so that's what it means to pad it with, with several zeros. Then on the right array, which is that second array, that second table, you do a double flip or a diagonal flip, same thing, okay? You flip it twice. Uh, and then there's a third step over here, which I'll get to in a moment, okay? So let me go through what that first step would have looked like. So the first step is, this was your table, right? That you were given on the, on the left to start with, which we thought might be the image, right? Uh, so you pad it with an ocean of zeros, okay? And uh, you could ask the question, well, you know, how many zeros do I need? Well, don't ask because the answer is an infinite number of zeros, okay? But in the end, it doesn't matter, okay? So that's, you'll see in the end why it doesn't matter in a few minutes. So then uh, the second step is to take that second table and to double flip it. So to double flip it means you first flip it around the x-axis, then you flip it around the y-axis, right? So that means you first flip it along rows and then you flip it along columns, okay? So that's the first flip. I basically uh, turned it upside down, right? Okay, that's the first flip I do. Then I do the second one, which is I turn it left to right. And now I finish my double flip, okay? And that would have been equivalent to a diagonal flip. I could have flipped it around a diagonal and got the same result. Okay, but that's fine. So I did that. Now I finished my step number two. Now step number three had said, it said then compute the weighted sum. So we wanna know what we mean by weighted sum. Okay, and so here we're showing an example of a different table of numbers and computing the weighted sum. So the idea is that um, you know how to compute the sum of something. You've all seen, uh, the summation notation in, uh, let me quickly uh, write something here. So why am I not able to write? Hmm. I'm missing something that normally lets me write. Uh, where is that? Okay, well, um, screen share or more, let me tell you more. Oh, uh, well, let me get out of this mode here. Maybe that's the problem. Okay, hang on one sec. Let me, um, hmm. if I stop sharing, then I can't proceed, right? Uh, what I just want to do is how to, uh, to allow it me to use my pen here, right? Because I need my pen for the rest of the presentation today. Um, I think that's a PowerPoint thing. Uh, no, I don't think it's a PowerPoint thing. I think uh, 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 I think it's because uh, there's something to do with, with the Robert setup. Uh, uh, so let me just call Robert real quickly. He set this thing up, this uh, zoom up. So. Hey, Robert. Hey, so normally I'm able to go to the top of my screen and it lets me uh, say something to uh, start my pen writing. I can't do that now. Is there some re is there something that is different about the way you set the zoom up or, or is it something that I'm doing different? We're still there. Thank you. Yes. I, I do have a three dot that says more, yeah. It doesn't say anywhere, open up the pen. It has all meeting related stuff. Hide video panel, 
and so on. Uh, this is uh, a little bit odd. So let me see uh, what else I can do, okay. Hmm. Let me try a different way to do my Zoom, how about that? Hmm. Drawing. So in PowerPoint, I can do, gosh. Um, do you ever use your pen when you're in Zoom? Do you ever use a pen when you're in Zoom? Like you, you open up a screen and write with it? But I'm, but, but I'm wondering if you can check on this Zoom whether it happens for you or not, if it gives you that option or not. Yeah, 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 just try that, thank you. So you may be the host. Gosh, but I don't even remember what I had to do. <laughs> I don't know why it's been so long since I've written with the Zoom. I mean, it was just a month ago I was using it to write. Um, so that you just move the mouse to the top of the screen and it opens up that panel, right? Uh, which it's not even opening up the file menu for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me stop share. I'll stop share for a moment. Uh, people, have, sorry. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It opened up a pen menu at the bottom. Let me see if that's what I need. Okay. Pen at the bottom. Hmm? PowerPoint, but that's okay if it's PowerPoint, right? As long as, as long as I can, I can use it. Okay, as long as they can see it. So let me ask them. Hey, people, so I'm going to try to write something on the screen. So first of all, can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, going to the, I'm going to write something on the screen and you tell me if you can see it. Can you see that? Yes, I can see the sigma. Okay, very good. Okay, Robert, that's fine. I'm all set for now. Bye. Okay, yeah, so PowerPoint indeed um, control the, the pen writing. So uh, so we have to make sure that I can, I can use it, right? Okay, so that's fine. So what I was going to say to you was a summation, right? This sigma symbol, I'm assuming you've all seen this by now in your life somewhere in math, right? Uh, if you haven't, please tell me right now that you have not seen it, right? This sigma, this sigma notation, okay? Uh, sigma notation just means to add something up. And typically it says I equals one to some N or something like that, right? Okay. So the point is, uh, that's what we mean when we say some, the sum of the convolution, right? Um, we're talking about that. So in this case, there's the green table over here that we have put these numbers in. And uh, in the green table, we are saying, uh, that we want those those numbers to be added up. We want them to be sum, summed up, right? So we want it to be 40 plus 42 plus 46 plus the second 46 plus the 50 plus the 55 plus the 52 plus the 56 plus the 58 and so on, okay? So that's what we would want. Um, so now we're saying we want a weighted sum, W-E-I-G-H-T-E-D. So we want each of these numbers, before they go into the summation over here, we want them to be included with a weight, okay? And that weight, is given by this table over here. So that means what we're gonna do is we're gonna use these weights of zeros on all of these numbers, except for the 42, the 42 is gonna get the one in it, right? So therefore, when you add up that summation, you're gonna get the answer number 42 and that answer you place in the center of where you had located this table in relation to this table. That means you had put this table here, you had placed it over here, centered at this red square. So you put the answer in the red square here. Okay, is that is that kind of concept clear? Okay. Yes, uh, I so have one now, question. Yeah, go ahead. So in the little red text below, you say if it's even dimensions, then it goes in the upper left corner. That makes sense for a two by two grid, but what if we have a four by four? Like let's say the green box extended to the 52 and the 60. Would that go where the 40 is right now or like where would it, where would it go? 
Well, so realistically, uh, just to be clear, realistically, um, it's not a question to worry about, meaning, and there's some debate about where to put it, okay? So, so that's the reason why I'm not giving you a definite answer, right? Uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, you will make a decision where to put it. And as long as you're consistent in whatever you're doing, then it's all okay, right? Uh, so you make a decision either upper right, lower right, second row, third column, whatever, okay? Um, but realistically, much of the time for what we're doing, we're gonna be using uh, odd size tables. So it's easy to know where the center is, okay? Um, so then let me move on to the next slide. Um, okay, very good. And so, uh, and so what I wrote also disappeared with that slide, right? So now how about if I go back, is that writing there? Yeah, it's there, okay, I see. Okay, so now we, have, um, we bring back our actual numbers, right? So this was the weighted sum we were doing. So this was the first step we had done in the ocean of zeros. This is the second double flipping that we just finished doing. And now the third step is to take the weighted sum, right? So the very first step is we take these four numbers and we place them in these four locations over here. And then you go ahead and you, uh, you uh, put that answer over here, okay? And again, I'm gonna to get my pen up and running. Pen. Okay, so now uh, we're done with that first step. Now we let's do the next step. We, so just so you know, that calculation that we just did and we got the answer zero is an example of what I call, okay, nobody else calls it that. I call it that, a one location convolution, okay? So one location convolution means we placed our table from the right, we placed it in one place on the left and we got one number back and that's why we call it a one location convolution, okay? Now, if we move that location of the table on the left, if we move it across, then we have a scanning convolution. And scanning convolution is what, what everybody else normally calls convolution, okay? So I have decided to separate out the two tasks into a one step, one location convolution. And then the issue of sweeping it over everything else is the scanning convolution, right? Okay, so now the next slides will show us that scanning convolution idea. So that means that, uh, we have that second table here. Now we move that table over to the right. So it's now these four locations here, instead of the original four locations were here the first time. Now the second time you did it over here. And now uh, we do the same calculation, we get the weighted sum and that answer is also zero. And so we write that adjacent to the previous one, one, one over on the right, okay? So that's what we do. Now we go to the, uh, to many steps later, right? We've gone scanning, scanning, scanning all the way to the right. And then we quit that row. Then we get into the second row and we did it and so on. And then we did a third row. Uh, so there was the first row, second row, third row. Finally, we get to the fourth row. And in the fourth row, we would have first done these guys. Then we will do these guys. Then we'll do these guys. And now we're dealing with what happens when we do these guys, okay? these four, right? Okay. So the point is now, uh, as an example, we can see that uh, the two and the zero and the zero and the zero are being sat over by the three and the one and the two and the zero, right? So obviously, uh, if you're following all of this, then you can see that the two and the one and the zero, they are weighted by zero. Uh, I mean, it's the opposite. Uh, their data has zeros in here. These are the weights but these waiting guys are waiting zero. So it's still zero, right? When you add them up. So the only one that has any effect is the three and the two. And that gives you the six as the answer over here. So is that completely clear to everybody about how we got that six? Okay, is there any one of you who's confused about that? Okay, good. So then we finally continue uh, to fill everything out. And what we get then is a, an answer like this, which would have had an ocean of, sorry, Sorry, oh. we get an answer like this, which would have had an ocean of zeros over here as well, right? This is what our answer would have been, right? Um, and so, and what I had shown you was, I had shown you this number first, and then I had shown you this number, okay? I'd shown you, uh, well, actually that's not true. I had shown you these numbers here first, and then I showed you this number here, right? That's what I'd shown you so far, okay? 
Uh, but now we're going ahead and we're filling everything out. And I recommend that you actually do that. Those of you that are beginners to this, I recommend that you spend 10 minutes actually filling this whole thing out and verifying that this is the kind of table that we get, right? But basically the bottom line is that uh, we don't want to, uh, we don't want to uh, look at all the zeros here. Uh, we only look at where the action is, so to speak, right? And so the action is, wherever you quit running into zeros and you run into something real, right? So we are just showing you this three by three answer over here, okay? Um, but again, I strongly recommend that you go and verify that you get these kinds of numbers by filling it all out yourself, right? Okay? So that's the notion of convolution and scanning convolution and so on. And so I wanna say that uh, we've defined convolution now and we know how to execute it. Let's put it aside because we're gonna need it in a few minutes. But just before we do that, I wanna, tell you one other thing here, which is that uh, the rules had said uh, that we are going to run these three steps. Right? This is step number one. This is step, sorry. This is step number two. This is step number three, the weighted sum and so on. And then we say the comment over here, in practice, we don't do the double flip. And in practice, we sometimes will not even do the embedding with the ocean of zeros, okay? So sometimes we'll just strictly go into the weighted sum calculation, even though it might be a scanning calculation that we do. We'll just go ahead and do it. Um, okay, um, so just so you know, right, that we're not always gonna do those first two steps. Okay, so here's where we were. So now we're ready to put aside the concept of convolution because we understand it so well. And we're ready now to move on to our original problem was we're given this image and we wanna find the edges, right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna consider taking a row of values from this image. Like let's say, I just take a slice of values over here. I take a cut through here, right? So now I can ask, uh, how about my values then in this red zone over here, right? Okay, let's just look at those values in the red zone over there. And uh, what I end up getting is, the values may have looked something like this. They might be low, close to zero over here. Okay, because they're dark and black areas, right? And then they jump up to the bright part of the chess piece. They jump up, jump up, jump up, and then they jump down again to black, okay? So basically uh, what our profile of that row looks like is something like this. Right? It's dark and then goes up and bright, and then it goes dark again and stays dark down there, right? Okay, so that's what the profile would have looked like. And so if we now take the absolute value in the jumps as we move sideways, right, the absolute value, the absolute value of this is a one. Uh, the, the difference in the, 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 the jump is a one, right? So the difference in the values is a one. The difference in here is also a one. The difference in here is also a one. But then the difference here is a 98. So we got a, a one over here, a one over here, a one over here. Then we jumped up to a 98. That's because this is the difference over here. Then again, we drop down. The difference here is again a one. Difference here is again a one, and so on and so on. Then we jump down again over here. The absolute value jump is now 97 and so on, okay? So are you following how I got this red plot at the bottom here? Okay, hopefully it's all very clear. Right? So now we can go ahead and write a little small piece of pseudocode for it. Um, so it says, while the row is not ended yet, we're gonna select the next A, B pair, right? A, B are the two values that we have to consider. And then we're gonna compute something called the difference for them, difference of B minus A, right? Uh, and then we'll say, if the absolute value of the difference is greater than some threshold, we always need a threshold because uh, over here, we got differences of one and so on. But here the difference was 98, right? So we don't care about these differences of one. We don't wanna know about them. They're too unimportant to us. This is an important jump. So we have a threshold in the story, okay? So the threshold is saying, uh, are you big enough to pay attention to, okay? So if the absolute value of the difference is greater than the threshold, then we're gonna mark that as an edge, okay? So that's a simple way to proceed sideways along rows and find the, the, uh, the edges, right? Okay, now the next step is the big intellectual jump here. And that is to realize that uh, this calculation here, difference equals B minus A, is the same as saying convolve the A and the B table of two numbers, right? 
the table of two numbers convolved with this yellow pair minus one plus one. Okay, that's the big intellectual jump. Intellectual jump meaning we are not actually doing any new computation, but we're coming up with a different notation for this, right? So you need to understand the notation is that we have realized that we can write the difference between any pair of numbers. We can write them as a convolution between the original pair of numbers convolved with a minus one and a plus one. Okay, so that's the story there. So that means that, uh, and I hope you have verified that, uh, that the one location convolution will be that, right? It'll be, you know, you place these two numbers over these guys, you multiply them out and then you add them up and that gives you B minus A, right? Okay, which is what we started out here saying, right? Okay, so again, that level of detail, you do want to kind of verify it at some point that you truly understand it. So that means we're now ready to write our pseudocode this way instead of what we had written it before. Previously, we had said A minus B or B minus A. Now we're not saying B minus A, we're saying A, B, the table of two numbers convolved with this new yellow table over here, okay? And then the rest is the same. So then we could run that and we'd, and we'd get some result. Now, uh, you do need to understand that this is the single step convolution, single location convolution, but it's embedded within a, a while loop. So that makes it a standard convolution, right? Because every time you're changing out the value of A and B, as you move from number to number, you change up your who's your A and your B, you're changing them out each time, okay? Okay, so the next uh, intellectual idea, which is only important for this topic, meaning it won't necessarily be important as you move forward for the rest of the day, is that uh, uh, what we had seen so far was how to find edges in, as we proceed in the X direction, right? as we proceed along a horizontal row, we know how to find edges. But now, well, what do you do as you proceed vertically? Okay, either upwards or downwards. And so it turns out you're supposed to do then the other part of the story, okay? And so here you've done the one part of the story for the horizontal process or the X direction. And now you have to do it for the Y direction or the vertical story, okay? So all you do is you, you run a very similar calculation. You take the A and the B now as vertical numbers from a column of numbers, and you convolve them with a minus one and plus one, the same as you did over here. But now the minus one and plus one are, are related to each other in a vertical manner, right? Okay, so you can do that. So basically you're gonna do two different calculations. You have your image, your picture here. You're first gonna convolve it with a table that is sideways like this. And then you're gonna take that same image and you're gonna convolve it with a table that is vertical, okay? So this is the first table, this is the second table, right? So we're gonna do two convolutions and that means you're gonna get two different outputs out, right? You understand this will give you one output, one output table over here, and this will give you the second output over here. Okay, so this will be your X answers and this will be your Y answers, right? Okay, your X result and your Y result. Okay, so now um, the uh, 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 little uh, math over here is that uh, whenever you have multiple values at the same location, uh, that's really a, 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 a vector, okay? So the vector is a pair of numbers in this case. There's the horizontal answer and the vertical answer. Um, it turns out a vector can be a, a list of any number of numbers, right? Uh, if you were in 3D, then your vector would have three quantities. It would have an X value, a Y value, and a Z value, right? Now, you've generally seen vectors in the context of direct things that have directions, and that's what you've seen them both in your physics classes and your, your early mathematics classes, and maybe a class in geometry or something. You might've seen vectors there. Um, and definitely, if you've taken advanced calculus class, you've seen some vectors there as well, okay? And those of you that have done calculus three, you've probably already seen vectors there as well. Uh, but the point is then, the vector can either be represented by the actual components in the vector, so the x component and the y component, or you can represent the vector as a magnitude and a direction, right? Okay, and there's a formula that gets you from the one representation, from this representation to this representation. There's a formula that gets you there, and that formula is basically this one, okay? So this is the magnitude of the vector formula. It's a square root of the numbers that are within the components of the convolution. So it's squared up the squares, I mean. So you square up the numbers first, you square up the, the X answer, and you square up the Y answer, and you add them up, 
you take the square root and that is the magnitude of the vector. Okay. And that basically should look totally familiar to you. That's the distance formula from geometry. Um, and that's because that's what really uh, 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 the magnitude of a vector is. You have some coordinate system with a center over there. You have a point there, you're gonna draw a vector to the point and you're asked for the length of that. What is the magnitude that you're asking? What is the length of that? Well, that length is given by the Pythagorean theorem, which is the square of that plus the square of that. That's the square of this, but the length of that is the square root of that. So that's why it's the square root of this, okay? So as you probably already know, the Pythagorean theorem leads to the distance formula, right? I'm assuming you, I don't know whether you remember that kind of thing from uh, middle school or early high school mathematics, but it does, if you follow it carefully, you get the distance formula from the Pythagorean theorem, okay? Okay, so um, basically what we have looked at then is that um, uh, we're looking at how to take the derivative of a function in the x direction and the derivative of a function in the y direction. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that these two calculations over here are approximations to a derivative, okay? Each one of the calculations is an approximation to a derivative. Now, uh, I'll take you back for a moment uh, to your calculus one class, or maybe it's done pre-calc, I'm not sure, uh, where they would have told you that, um, uh, as a very, very early chapter in it, would have told you that uh, you're given a bunch of numbers and the numbers might be uh, 10 and then 19 and then 25 and then 18 and so on. <laughs> and these numbers might represent the temperatures in a city uh, the average temperature of the day in a city, or uh, they, if if they had a huge uh, exponential power over here, then they might be uh, a population. Uh, this could be the population of that country uh, in a certain year. This could be the population in another year. This could be the population in another year. Of course, the population generally wouldn't jump down like this. So maybe this would go up to 28 if it was population, right? Okay. So so whatever it is, they would give you a set of numbers like that. And uh, what they ask you to do is they ask you to say the rate of growth or the rate of change of those numbers, right? And so the rate of change of those numbers is exactly what they mean by derivative later on when you think of this as a continuous set of numbers. When you think of them as a continuous set of numbers, you take the derivative of that function of that plot and that's the derivative that we know of as dy, dx, you know, d of f by dx and so on. But when they start talking to you about it, they say, take the difference between these two and get the one answer rate, then take the difference between these two and so on. And that's basically doing a convolution with that table of numbers with something like this, okay? So I just wanted to take you back to your early calculus to make sure that you understand that all we're doing is we're doing an approximation to the derivative when we do this. And that's the derivative in the X direction. And we're doing the approximation to the derivative in the Y direction when we do this, okay? So that brings us to this slide then, uh, which is that um, what we're doing then is the derivative in the x direction and the derivative in the y direction. We get two answers. We put them in a in a in a vector notation like this with a comma, right? It's a list of it's a list of quantities. So I just want to make sure that you're not scared away by this partial symbol. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Yes, go ahead, please. Uh, is the I isn't the I the identity matrix? No, 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 not at all, not at all, absolutely not. No, no, the I over here is my image. Okay. Is the image function right? Yeah, I've been used to it being the identity matrix, and it always is in algebra, but this is not algebra, right? Okay. This is not matrix algebra at all. This is in in fact. If you're getting confused about thinking that any of these tables and so on have anything to do with matrices, you're completely on the wrong track, okay? So make sure that you're not thinking about any of these things as matrices. They are not, absolutely not. They have nothing to do with matrix algebra, absolutely no connection to matrix algebra at all, right? This is just table stuff. This is just computer science table processing, right? Okay. Uh, 
so back to this i here with my image function and my image so i would have normally written it as f of x and y right right why why is it f of x and y why is there y in the story because my image is typically if i draw a grid over here right this is a grid I've tried to put perspective on it so that it looks like I'm looking down at the ground, right? Okay, so I have a grid and those are my, my positions of my pixels. And then within the grid, I have a value here, 85. And this value here is 94. And this value here is 96 and so on. So then these values constitute the function F, right? Are you all good with that concept? That what I'm looking at is I'm looking at a, a surface it's a surface of a function here sitting over this image somehow sitting over this grid and that surface is my function f and that f i am calling i for image function okay so that's why i'm taking the normally i would have said partial of f with respect to partial of x i would have said that normally in normal math but here because we're doing vision and images i'm saying partial of i with respect to x and partial of i with respect to y. Okay. Is that is that beginning to be clear to people? Okay, and so I don't want you to be worried about this partial symbol. The partial symbol is just the same as, this partial symbol is really the same as d of f by dx. The only reason I we have to use the partial symbol is because there were two dimensions, multiple dimensions, okay? If there was only one dimension, if f was just a function of x alone, then we would have used the d notation, right? But because f is a function of x and y, multivariable calculus, when you take the derivative, you get the partial derivative. It's the derivative only with respect to the x and only with respect to the y. And that's why they call partial derivative. Okay? But don't be scared away by that notation. I was when I learned that a long, long, long time ago in calculus. I thought, oh my gosh, this is really scary. I don't really understand it. Um, and it took a, a long time to get comfortable with it. And then definitely when I started studying vision, it all became so easily comfortable, right? Because vision is basically a two-dimensional study of two dimensions. Whereas, uh, whereas, uh, just one quick second, sorry, I've got a message over here. Okay. Um, so then uh, that combination of two partial derivatives, it has a name for it in math. And that name is called the gradient, okay? So that's the symbol for the gradient, the upside down triangle. Uh, this thing over here, don't be confused about it. It's just stupidly saying, it's a really stupid symbol. It's just saying it's the definition of, right? So this is saying the gradient in math is defined by this, okay? So don't be worried about this at all. That's just saying this is defined by. This is what you should kind of be a little bit worried about because it's gonna come up later on it's called the gradient, okay? And the gradient is basically the group of partial derivatives of that function, right? In this case, the function only has two variables. Later on today, we'll have the concept, at the end of today, we'll have the concept of, um, our function will be much more complicated. We'll have many, many variables. It's, it's no longer an image anymore in that function we're gonna consider later on in the day. And so then you'll get partials of many parts. There'll be partial of first variable, partial of second variable, partial of the third variable, partial of the fourth variable, and so on. Okay. So we're doing it here also to introduce the concept of gradient in this easy way for images. Later on, you'll see the concept of the gradient in something much more challenging, okay? Okay, so so far so good. Are we all good with gradient and so on, people? Yep. Okay, and again, those of you that I'm, uh, so I'm only seeing the way it is. I've got set up only three people's pictures are showing up for me here. I guess I could look at the rest to see what you guys are doing. But I'm assuming if there was any problem, you'd start yelling at me, right? Because I'm not quite paying attention to you guys in that sense, okay? I need you to yell for me to know that you need help, okay? Okay, so then I will move along. Uh, what happened next? Why is it not? Uh... Okay, so sorry. Um, so, yeah, so uh, that's called the gradient of the magnitude. Uh, sorry, the, the gradient, this is the gradient, right? This is the gradient over here. 
this is the gradient. And now because the gradient is a vector, I can ask for its magnitude, right? And that's shown, you already saw magnitude with the double bars in your life. Have you seen this double bar with the magnitude? Who has never seen that, right? So you've all seen magnitude somewhere, magnitude of a vector, okay? Uh, so that's the magnitude of the vector. And then uh, in practice, that would be then calculated by this, right? You'll be taking the partial derivative with respect to x, then you'll square it. You'll take the partial derivative with respect to y, you'll square it. And then you'll add it up and then you take the square root and that'll give you one answer, one number back and that's the magnitude for that location, okay? For that x, y location. Okay, so uh, then I just wanted to say that that technique is actually called the Roberts algorithm. Okay, what I did so far, if I just did this approach, then that's called the Roberts algorithm. Okay. Now uh, we're going to look at a, 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 and so then I could I could apply thresholding. Okay. So thresholding, if that's my function, uh, I want to ignore the ones and so on at the bottom here, the small numbers, I want to ignore them. So I'll have to have a threshold, right? Some threshold that'll cut those guys off, right? So that's the idea here that I can have a threshold bar and I can raise it or I can lower it, right? Um, and uh, we picked a threshold to decide. Next three slides will show you examples of different thresholding limits. So if this is your magnitude plot that you will get, from plotting that what you got from the Roberts algorithm, if you plot that, it would look something like this, right? Then uh, if you apply a, a low threshold, I'm applying the low threshold to this, okay? I'm, I'm using this now as my magnitude step. I got the magnitude from this. I'm taking the magnitude and I'm applying a low threshold, so a low bar, right? So imagine that, if I take a slice through here, right, then what it really looks like is like this, right? You all agree that this red, if I take a cross section of this over here, these red values, when I plot them in height, they look like this. Do you all, do you all agree with that? Okay. And so now what I'm doing is I'm gonna apply a threshold over here that I can raise up or I can lower down, right? My threshold to decide who remains, right? So with a low threshold, I got these results. And with a higher threshold, I decided I don't want thick edges like this. I don't want thick fat edges like that. That's pretty useless to me. I want thinner edges. But then when I lower the threshold, uh, when I raise the threshold, then I get thinner edges, but then I also lose my horse's head, right? The reason I lose the horse's head, by the way, uh, is because if you look at the jump here from the black to the white, the jump is very shallow, right? But very shallow jump means um, the derivative is very low. So if the derivative is very low, that means I get a low magnitude for that derivative vector, for the gradient vector. And low means when I see it in the, mag in the magnitude image, I see a very low faint answer over here. See how faint it is there, right? That faintness is reflected in the fact that then I lose it when I apply a high threshold, okay? Uh, so this is just showing you the code that would actually compute the uh, magnitude thing. Okay, I'm going to square my x values and I'm going to square my y values. I'm going to add them up and then I'm going to square root that and that would calculate my magnitude for me. Okay, so my magnitude at ij will be, uh, uh, in, in my program I was calling it iVal, but it's really the magnitude function. Then I would do that. Okay, don't worry about this. This has some other role for something else. Okay, so now what I'm gonna do is, um, I'm gonna now take you to another step of, of the process, thinking about things. And that is that, uh, whereas our original ridge that we're looking at, our original, uh, this piece over here that we're looking at, right? Uh, but actually not there because I think I'd started out talking about it up here and I hadn't talked about it in the magnitude context. I talked about it in the original chess piece context. Right? So let me go back to that original chess image I had shown you. Yeah, yeah, this one. Okay, so this is what I'm talking about right here, right? 
So if I look at that plot again, then the plot of that looks like this. It turns out it's not nice like the blue curve is showing here. The blue curve is what it should have been, but in practice, because of something called noise and so on, the actual result we are measuring looks like this, okay? Now, where does the noise come from? Uh, do people have an idea? Now, those of you that have already watched the video from last year, you might know the answer to this and that's fine. Uh, you can say the answer if you want to, but if you haven't watched the video as well, you can guess what noise comes from uh, and, and give me some num some reasons why I get noise in my in my original measurement of the picture. Where does the noise come from? So now's the time for you guys to speak up. I'm not a photographer, but doesn't it come to um, come from like variations in lighting and from like the sensor itself? Okay, so you have said two different reasons there and they're both correct. Uh, the sensor itself is uh, not perfect in what it records as the measurement. Uh, and then from the lighting, uh, because the Envision, it's uh, taking an average of a very, very tiny uh, durations of time, very, very tiny durations of time. It's taking an average of the light falling on it. Uh, that light may not have been averaged properly, right? So you're correct. It's both due to the lighting and due to the, uh, the sensor itself. Uh, but then there are lots of other reasons for errors. Sometimes the lens itself might be a bit messy, not quite a clear lens and so on. And maybe a speck of dust sat on the, on the lens. You, you know, dust floats through the air all the time. And so typically you have to keep cleaning your lens, but if you don't by accident, then that affects what you record, right? Okay, so there's lots of reasons to get noise. Um, and um, the bottom line is that that's what your measurement of an actual image really looks like. It looks jagged like that rather than something nice and smooth like the blue curve, okay? So what we want is the blue curve, right? Because we want to apply our derivative calculation and so on to the blue curve rather than to the red curve, okay? So um, what we're going to do then it turns out is uh, we're going to do smoothening. We're gonna to try to achieve a blue curve for ourselves. And that smoothening is going to be achieved by uh, taking a, an average, okay? So an average uh, is basically if I have four numbers, uh, uh, well, if I have, let's say 10 numbers, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and J. Okay, so these are all numbers in some grid of a picture that I have, right? And of course I have more numbers down here. Uh, but I don't want to know what they are. So they may be P, Q, and so on. Um, now, if I want to average these four values here, if I want to get their average and then I want to distribute that average to the four locations, right? Then later on, I'll, I'll take the average of these four and distribute that average to those four and so on. Then believe it or not, that will achieve a smoothening for me, right? that will smoothen things out. It won't be a perfect smoothening, but it will be some sort of smoothening because what it means is that supposing the numbers had been the A, B, A, B F, G, supposing they were uh, like uh, 25 and 36 and 94 and uh, two, if those are my four numbers, uh, then the average, then as I go from number to number, I get huge jumps, right? In these numbers from 25 to 36, I get a huge jump. From 36 to two, I get a huge jump. From 94 to two, I get a huge jump. But if I do this, if, if I take the average of them and the average is whatever it is, I mean, I'm not gonna calculate it right now live, uh, but I'm assuming it's approximately, this is about 130 here plus another 30. So it's about 160 divided by four. So the average is around 40, okay? So if I get that average and I put that as my, if I replace the numbers by the average, so I put a 40 over here, 40 over here, 40 over here, 40 over here. Then you understand that I now have a smoother result, right? Okay. Well, so that smoothening is obtained by computing an average. And I want you to understand that computing an average in convolution is achieved by convolving these four numbers with these four quarter numbers here. Okay. Because the one location convolution uh, algorithm told us that we we'll pick the A and the B and the F and the G and we'll uh, weight them with these quarters. So what I'm really getting is I'm getting a quarter 
times the A plus a quarter times the B plus a quarter times the C plus a quarter times the D, right? Okay, are we all clear on that's what I get when I do the convolution, right? The one step convolution. Well, but that's the same as saying one quarter times A plus B plus C plus D. Um, uh, I have a question. So do you re do you replace A, B, C, and D uh, with 40, like with the average? Yeah, that would be that would be what you're kind of doing. Okay, that would be what you're kind of doing. Okay, now in practice, so that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is just replace the upper corner, whatever we said, right? Whatever, because it's the only two by two thing. Uh, replace the upper left corner or something by it. Then you take the same four, and instead of moving them to C, D, H, and I, you'd move them to B and C and G and H, right? And you compute that, and that answer you put in the place of B, okay? Then you move them to the C and D and H and I and take that and that answer you put in the place of C. You move them to these four and that answer you put in the place of D. Okay, do you see how you have many choices of how to proceed, right? Okay, but either way, the point is that that averaging process is going to give you a smoother answer than what you originally had in the numbers that were here, okay? Because averaging always smoothens things out, right? Okay, so now, uh, what we just do some mathematical gimmickry over here to see that um, what we're taking is our original picture, right? Our original picture, we wanna convolve it with these four quarters over here, right? But what we're gonna do instead then is we're gonna pull out the common quarter and leave just four ones in the table, right? So we're going to write, instead of doing it directly like this, where this is convolved with this, instead we are scratching that and we're saying, we're gonna pull out the common quarter over here. We pull it out over here. And then we're just gonna convolve the image with these four ones. You'll see how I did that. I converted this operation into this operation, okay? Right, I did that conversion, okay? So then I still have to do my derivative part, right? Meaning I just finished smoothening the image here. I smoothened it out with this. Then I still have to do my Roberts-like derivative part, which was this, right? Okay. But it turns out the developer of this approach said, let's double it up. It doesn't really change the answer at all. Uh, it changes it by a tiny amount, uh, but, let, but let's double it up. The main reason they did that is because they wanted a square two by two table for the derivative instead of a, what Roberts had, see Roberts had had just side by side things, right? Roberts had had minus one plus one and this way. And actually, just so you know, the real Roberts operator hadn't even done that. The real Roberts operator had done this. Okay, so the real Roberts operator had set itself up to take the derivatives in the diagonal direction, right? Okay. Uh, why, I, I stated this in the in the tape from last year, uh, but whether you've known that or not, whether you saw the tape or not, why, why did Roberts set it up as a square table instead of tables like this? Did people understand that in, if, those of you that watched the tape from last year? So did the rest, did you guys really not watch that tape from last year? And that's okay if you didn't, but just tell me. Who saw the tape from last year? In Dr. Shaw's le uh, recorded lecture from yesterday, is that the one you're talking about? No, the one from the notes that Robert would have put up a week ago from last year's presentation. My, my own presentation. It would look pretty similar to what I'm doing today. And except I look a year younger in that, in that video. So really nobody watched it at all, honestly. Okay, well, that's kind of good news because it means you're not bored by what I'm talking about today, right? Uh, but anyway, the reason why uh, Roberts back in the day uh, set this up as a, as a square table rather than a two differently sized rectangles was because Roberts was limited by the programming code available to the computer back in 1964. Actually, the work was probably done in 1963, but it was published in 64, right? So computers were very, very, very primitive back then. And so uh, 
Roberts needed to reuse the code for running this convolution and running this convolution. All Roberts wanted to do was change out the numbers and use the same code, right? And I'm assuming you understand that if you convolve with this versus this, you'd have to use two different pieces of code for these two guys, right? So this would be a different piece of code than to convolve with this. Whereas if you have a two by two, the convolution code is the same, right? Because they're both two by two, okay? So that's the reason why very early on they started uh, getting square tables rather than rectangular tables like this, okay? So uh, here we're doing the derivative this way, okay? Uh, minus one, minus one, and plus one, plus one. And so now, what we're being asked to do is to uh, calculate this, right? And by something called the associative property. So associative property in math is that A times B times C. Associative property says that's equal to saying A times B times C, right? That's the associative property of multiplication. It turns out convolution is similar to multiplication except convolution involves tables. But anyway, the associative property carries forth uh, is also true for convolution. So you can move over the parentheses from this. You can move them over to this. Okay, and that's what we're doing here. Okay. So we move it over. And now that means that we can now go ahead and compute the answer from this. And, and how do we compute the answer from this? What is the approach we're gonna take? Where did you see that done earlier in the day? I mean, the day hasn't been that long. I've only been talking to you for about, oh, I guess I've been talking to you for about an hour, uh, but still it hasn't been that long. So where did I tell you how to get the answer for this? I'm checking to see if you've been paying attention in the last hour or not, right? Well, to do that one, you'd have to, I guess like go pixel by pixel and compute the weighted sum. But, but what is it, which part of the presentation dealt with that topic? Well, if I go back in my... No, don't look. I mean, you should just try to remember it. Right? It, it was in the, the convolutions. The yeah, definition was... of convolution, right? The yeah. definition of convolution was that I told you three steps, right? And those tables that I used as an example were two tables. Each of them was two by two, right? So that's what I have here. I have a two by two table and I have another two by two table. So you know how to get the answer for this if you had to do it, right? It turns out then the answer is indeed this, okay? It's a three by three, just like we got in that example when we worked out, remember we had a six and all at the bottom down here. There was a six somewhere here in that table's answer, right? That answer that I'm talking about that I, I recommended you do it carefully on your own. I told you, please go and spend some time doing it on your own if you've never done it before. So it turns out um, the answer for this is this, okay? Uh, I have a quick question ahead, about the previous slide. This um, one? Yeah, I guess I'm just a little bit confused by the uh, constant one fourth on the left. Okay, sure, that... yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so the thing is, uh, first of all, you understood how we got the constant to be there at all? You understood how yes. it came from? It came from because the constant was originally in here, right? Each one of these were one quarter. Right, but that is mathematically equivalent to turning these guys into ones and pulling out the quarter here. Okay, mm -hmm. that's mathematically equivalent to that. Meaning you can check the calculation will give you that. Right, both ways you can run a calculation and run it through carefully, and realize that you're multiplying your four values in here by these four oh, quarters. Right, right, right. I see. Yeah. Okay. Right. So I, that I see was the pre yeah. that was the previous slide I showed you, where I showed you this. Right. I said you're doing this. But that's the same as just simply adding up the four numbers. That means adding them up just by themselves means I'm multiplying them by one, right? Right? And then yes. divide, and then multiply by a quarter of the four. Okay, the same calculation. Okay, so I'm glad you asked that question. Uh, sometimes, you know, uh, oh. some, pe some people are more honest than others. And you are honest in saying you were confused about this. I bet there's at least two others of you that are confused. Just statistically, that must be the case. Two others of you that are as confused, but you were never open enough to say you were confused about where that quarter came from. Okay. Right. And My question professor. was more um, how the uh, 
how that works out with the... Maybe I'm just completely blanking on something, but the how that works with the associative property in the next... Yeah, 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 yeah. No, no, no. So that's a good point. <laughs> so that's a very good point. Because it's a multiplication, it just stays out of the multiplication on its own, right? It stays out there. And then at the very end, I have a cheating slide over here that says, we're going to get rid of the quarter completely. We're going to destroy it, right? Just kill it. Because failing to do that step, given that we did not do that step, that means our output is just a quarter times too big, right? It's four times too big, right? Instead of my answers being instead of my answers being hundred and hundred and five and hundred and ten and two hundred and two hundred and fifteen and three hundred and fourteen, now my answer table is instead four hundred, four twenty, four forty, eight hundred. Eight, uh, is it 860, guys? Who's going to help me do this one fast? Uh, yes, 860. And this one fast in your head? <laughs> uh, 12, um, 56. Ah, oh, 56. Thank you. Okay. So this would have been the answers we would have gotten, right? Now, by multiplying it by a quarter, we then get this, which is the correct answer, right? But the point is you can forget to do that. That's okay. Why? Because in the end, you're going to apply some fake threshold that somebody will tell you what threshold should be to decide who's an edge or not, right? Right? So all you're going to do is you're going to multiply your original threshold that you would have used here, multiply it by four, and then it's going to be fine over here. Okay? So that's the reason why we can ignore all these constant factors at the top. Okay? Okay. So basically the point was this is the table we get. And so now our deal is you have an image. You simply convolve it with this table minus one, zero, plus one, minus two, zero, plus two, minus one, zero, plus one. Okay? Do people understand? And that gives you the X output answer, the X convolution answer, okay? And then uh, turns out that's for the X convolution answer right there. And then it turns out you want to also do it in the Y direction. So the Y direction simply is, I would have taken this table and I'd have turned it on its side to minus one plus one, right? That's what it would have been. And then I would have doubled up on it. <coughs> minus one plus one, right? So now it's a table like this. So basically I took this table and I turned it completely on its side. I did, I did like a 90 degree rotation or something, right? To get this, right? So it turns out the answer table in place of this for the Y direction is also going to simply be this table turned on its side by 90 degrees, okay? So I get these two tables here, this one and this one. Okay, do people see that? Okay, and so now I know how to get my magnitude of my, my magnitude of my gradient answer, I simply run this calculation. I run this calculation on my images. At each position, I square them, I add them up, I take the square and I get my final answer. And that final answer then basically uh, looks like that final answer looks like this image, which I don't want to have all this red here anymore. So I'm going to erase the red. Okay, so this is my final answer that I get back out from, it turns out in both cases, whether I run the Roberts operator, the Roberts operator only convolved with The Roberts operator convolved with this and with this, and then squared and square rooted and got an answer. It will look somewhat like this. And instead, if I use the Sobel, that second table is called the Sobel operator, by the way. Minus one, minus two, uh, minus one, zero, zero, zero. 
plus one, plus two, plus one. Okay, so whether I use this pair of numbers or this pair of numbers, I'm gonna get an answer that looks very similar to this, okay? Uh, because can you tell me what is the difference between this pair of numbers and this pair of numbers? So this is the Roberts operator. And this is the other person, the new person called Sobel, right? What is the difference between these two approaches? One already has the smoothing and one needs the smoothing to be done beforehand. Or we'll never do it, okay? Or we'll never do it, yeah. Yeah, so this is the Roberts that doesn't involve any smoothing and the Sobel involves the smoothing. That's all, that's the only difference, okay? So that's why these results look very similar because the smoothening of this image from the Roberts case will still look very similar to the Sobel, to, 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 to the Roberts output itself. It'll just be a slightly smoother version of it. Okay, so that's the story on that. Now, uh, we are pretty much done with this topic for now. Uh, I only introduced it for you to know that um, in the past, people designed their convolutions, right? So we saw uh, uh, several convolutions being designed in what I've presented in the last hour. Can somebody summarize for me what the designs were? Looking for changes in the horizontal direction, looking for changes in the vertical directions. So those, vertical both direction. count as one, those both count as one operation, meaning they're both the same okay. kind of idea, right? And then what's mm -hmm. the next idea? What was the other convolution you saw? Um, there was the smoothening one. Very good. Very good, so the smoothening is the next one, right? But the point I wanted to make to you is that those are by design, okay? So we designed them to be that way. Uh, so it turns out we could have gone on to design a slightly better smoothener. This uh, one person named Kenny, uh, actually, I don't believe it was Kenny who did it first, it was somebody else who did it first, but Kenny made it, uh, made it a little bit more perfect. Uh, went on to say that uh, if you smoothen with the four ones, so zero one one zero zero one one zero zero one zero 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 and up here zero 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 zero. If you smoothen with this kind of table, then what you've done is you've taken you imagine taking a slice through that, then the plot looks like this, right? It's called a hat hat function or a box function. Then that it turns out preserves the kinks that are shaped like this if those kinkinesses are in the input, the output will continue to have those kinks, okay? Versus instead you use a smoothener like this, which is a bell curve, it has no kinks at all, right? It's guaranteed to be a smoother output, okay? But the only thing about it, that means that now your table is not a simple table like this. Your smoothening table now has to look something that comes from a function of values like this. So it, it'll look like, when you plot it, it'll look like this, okay? Or I can show you a set of table values might look like this, okay? So this is called Gaussian smoothening, bell curve smoothening, right? Uh, you can't get a three by three bell curve. It doesn't make sense. You need at least five by five, seven by seven and so on to get a nice bell curve smoothening. But the point about the bell curve is that it guarantees you no kinks, okay? So again, that's by design, right? Somebody's saying, well, I want no kinks at all, so let me smoothen even better than, than, the, than, the, than the box function did the four ones, right? Okay, but, but whatever, convolution used to be by design in the past. Okay, so that's it for that topic. Uh, I just wanted you to know uh, how a basic idea of edge detection worked, but also how convolution was being done in the past. So now we're gonna move on to my next set of slides. So I will hang up on this one and I will open up my second set, which is, oh, actually just before I do that, uh, let me show you the code for Sobel, just to show you what actually happens in the code so that you know that there's no mystery to convolution and all that, right? 
So first of all, can you see some C code up here, everyone? Yes. Is my screen still being shared or not? Yeah, it is. Okay, so you're seeing some C code up here, right? This is all in C, okay? Um, yeah. So this is the original cable that, sorry, I guess I lost my, can I still do, oh, I'm not in PowerPoint anymore. So now I wonder if I can open up my, no, I still can't open up my pen here somehow, okay. Well, so I'll just use this, this highlighting facility. Okay, so highlighting shows me my cables that I just generated a couple of minutes ago theoretically, right? I got the equations for them and so on, I got these tables. So I will store my two tables in these two masks. Uh, this is just code to read in my, my image and so on. Uh, and, and, and actually, sorry, this, this code just opens up the file that I need for my input image and my output image. This code is strictly opening up and reading in my input image. So don't get too detailed in it. It's not that important. What is important is this part of the code over here, which is that uh, this is doing the convolution for us. Okay. So this part of the code is the double for loop that decides where to place my smaller table, right? I'm going from, my images are size 256 by 256. In, in this particular world, they were that size, 256 by 256. I have something called a mask radius. The mask radius helps me to avoid uh, worrying about the uh, padding, the embedding in an ocean of zeros. The reason I have to embed a notion of zeros is so that uh, then if I want to get the value for the upper left corner, I have to have somebody sitting outside of the corner so that my smaller table doesn't end up trying to multiply its values with non-existent values, right? So I have to pad it with zeros, okay? But if I'm willing to sacrifice that border and say I will only get answers for within some margin that I don't care about the values of the margin, then I will go ahead and I will tell it to only give me uh, within a mask radius. So I'll go in by a mask radius amount and I will go shy of the border by a mask radius amount. So I'm basically avoiding that whole mask radius area, but I'm doing all the rest of them. This is a, a double for loop that goes through all the rest of the positions. And then for each one of those positions, I'm going to place my smaller table over the bigger table. And I'm going to calculate nine, nine because it's three by three table, right? So nine, this is a, three by three for loop, it goes minus one to plus one. And this one goes minus one to plus one. So three by three tables, I get my convolution answers and I store them in my two output pixels over here, output X and output Y, okay? And then later on, I simply do the square rooting over here and I got my final magnitude answer over here. And finally, I simply scale that answer down. Don't worry about why I scale, it's totally not important. And then I print it out this way. In C, you print out your values this way. And I print it out to a file and then that's what I have in my picture. Which I can then display as I showed you the chest borders and so on, okay? So that's all that's going, that's the Sobel code. Uh, I just wanted to show you that really quickly so that you have access to it. Uh, now I'm gonna start something completely new and it's going to be related to machine learning, right? Okay, however, it's not the machine learning that is most important these days. Uh, so the reason I'm doing it also is kind of a legacy reasons, uh, both to tell you the, the history of this machine learning uh, material, but also because I believe this example of machine learning that I'm gonna tell you about, even though it's not that hot these days, it's not that hot because it's not gonna beat what you're going to be doing for the rest of the day today and what you're going to be doing uh, in the rest of the summer. Uh, it's still worthwhile knowing about, and it also helps explain things very more clearly, I believe, than some of the neural network stuff does, right? So it's important to spend some time about to understand it. And so uh, the technique is called boosting, okay? And uh, the idea is that, uh, I want to be able to do face detection. So I want to be able to produce a, I want to be able to give the system a picture like this and come back with all the faces, boxes drawn around the faces, right? Okay, obviously these days this is boring material because everybody's cell phone does this. 
Um, every modern camera does this as well. But 20 years ago, that was not easily possible, okay? So we are literally going back about 20 years. Uh, and so 2000, and 2000, 2001 is when the work I'm talking about now was being done, right? Okay, so uh, the idea is that uh, let us first start with the motivation. Uh, the motivation originally was not computer vision. The motivation was, uh, you know, financial application. And the idea is, uh, supposing you have a rich person, RP, right? Uh, who would like to hire a small team of experts, okay? To do what? To basically be able to do stock market forecasts, right? So the way the stuff, stock market life works is at eight, the market opens at 9.30 every morning, right? And I don't know who of you is paying attention to the stock market these days, uh, but I suspect today it's gone sideways as well. It hasn't necessarily gone down or anything. Uh, and uh, so later on, we can go look at it if, if you really want to see how the stock market works. But the point is um, the market opens at 9.30 every morning, New York time. And so by 8.30 every morning, that expert stock person has to decide whether they can make a prediction for the rest of the day, whether the market's going to, in this case, we're going to keep it simple. We're just going to say whether the market is going to go up or the market's not going to go up. Okay. We're not going to talk about the market going down because that complicates our example a little bit. Okay. So we're not going to deal with the market going down situation, right? So either the market goes up or the market stays flat. Okay. That's what the predictor, that's what the expert has to predict, right? And supposedly the expert, so they know what's going on in the background and what's going on in the economy and all that. So they should be able to say it. Well, it turns out they're not always correct, right? So this rich person, one rich person has access to 10,000 experts, okay? It could have been like 100,000 experts, whatever number of them. But if you make it too big, then that's bigger than the number of experts in the US, right? I suspect there's 10,000 stock market experts in the US, okay? Uh, but this rich person has access to their performance records for the past five years, which it turns out is 1,000 days because each year has about 200 stock trading days, okay? You would know the weekends and then you'd know other special holidays and all that. Okay, so roughly 1,000 days, they have the performance for each one of these people. And so what the rich person has is a table like this, right? The table says uh, for expert one, this was the performance for those 1,000 days, right? Uh, for table, for expert two, this was the performance for the 1,000 days. For expert three, this was the performance and so on. And so a check mark means the expert called that day correctly. The expert said, yes. The, the expert said the market was gonna go up or stay flat. And indeed, by the end of the day, you were able to verify that the market did exactly that, right? Okay. If the expert got it wrong, then you put a cross across it, not a check mark, right? So that's what these symbols mean over here. Okay. And we're just listing day one, day two, day three, obviously all the other days in here, then day 100 and so on over here and all the following days down here. So you have a long table of 1000 values for the 1000 days, right? Okay, so now the rich person's job is to form their team of 50 because the rich person cannot afford to hire all 10,000 or 100,000 experts. The rich person cannot do that. The rich person can only afford to hire 50 of them, right? So uh, how does the rich person pick the first team member of this team that the rich person wants to form? Okay, so, so how would they do that? The one with the most no, number of checks. Yeah. So as it says here in fine print, it says we would pick as the first team member the expert with the most number of checks, okay? That's correct. So now it's the correct move to do that, to pick the, the one with the most number of checks, that's correct. Now then the strategy is how to pick the second one, right? Now, here's the point. Um, some of you might have read the material before. Uh, if you already did it, then don't reply. Uh, and uh, I say here to email the instructor because these slides are from an online class that I teach this material too. Um, and so we want them to pause watching this video and then go ahead and email me, right? But here, we're not gonna email anybody. You're just gonna tell me what you think. Now, but if you already know the answer because you've known this material already, then probably don't say it. Uh, but if you don't know this material, you haven't seen this before, then try to guess what the strategy should be, right? I don't know the answer, but I do have a guess. Is, is that okay? Uh, but. But I'm curious why you don't know the answer. Was this not done in the class that you took with Dr. Rawat? 
Um, no, no, this wasn't, no. Okay, that's pretty good. That's pretty good then you're learning something new here. Yeah. Um, so go ahead and uh, and take a guess. What is it? Okay. So if, uh, if the person, uh, the first person that you picked was the most right, then you would want a person that picked the times that he got wrong, the person that got right, um, okay. those answers. <laughs> yeah, and that's the completely correct answer. So it turns out that's not what people would have normally said. Okay, normal people say, uh, pick the second most correct expert, right? And then pick the third most correct expert and form your team that way, right? So you're picking the best 50 experts that way. But it turns out that's wrong. What you want to do instead is what you said. You want it to be that you want to pick the expert who gets the most correct from the examples that the first expert got wrong, okay? So that means that you want to be the expert who complements the existing team. If the existing team is made up of only one so far, then you want to complement that expert and, and do better than that expert did on the ones that that expert got wrong, right? Okay, and then so on and so forth. You'll pick the 25th member as the one who complements the first 24 members so far and so on, right? You're building up a team that's better and better every time, okay? So that's basically the boosting approach. And uh, of course, boosting means picking a team from weak experts. So a weak expert is somebody, uh, see if you already had a expert that was getting 99.9% .9 correct on your training data. So when you go back to this table over here, if there was somebody who had correct, 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 one wrong, correct, 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 correct. Okay, and only one wrong, then that's one out of a thousand wrong, right? That's 99.9, .9, okay? Uh, if that expert is that way, then would you even need the rest of the team? You wouldn't, right? Because that expert's pretty good. They're gonna make an error one, once in a thousand times. No one cares. That's the error rate we're prepared to accept, right? So the point is, it's not realistic to expect an expert to be that good. Okay, that will not happen in reality. So what you wanna be is realistic and you want to say that your experts are somewhere between 51% correct and somewhere in the 80s, right? Mid 80s maybe. Somewhere in there, they, they're correct. Correct means out of a thousand, then uh, they would have gotten 510 correct. That's 51%, right? Or out of a thousand, they might've gotten 800 correct or something, which would be 80% correct, right? But not 999 correct. Because boosting will let you do that. Your team will be 99.9%, .9%, but built out of weak experts, okay? But weak experts must be 51% or better. So if they were 47% correct, what is the strategy in this game? Let's say- uh, let's Randomly say some, guess? Let's say some expert uh, gives you 450 days correct, right? And the other 550 days is wrong. How do you deal with that expert? Do you throw them away? You pick the things that they don't select. So you mean- Like you, you do the their, opposite? Correct. Yeah, you do you, the so opposite flip, of what they say. You flip their answer, right? Correct, correct, correct. So if they're that bad an expert, you just do the opposite, right? If they're only 30% correct, that means they're 70% wrong. So just flip whatever they do. And now you have a 70% correct expert, right? Okay, so that's, that's correct. Now, when is it that flipping doesn't benefit you at all? When it's exactly 50%. Correct, when it's exactly 50%, you're kind of screwed, okay? You can't do anything. So those 50% experts, you have to throw them away for sure, okay? Because there's nothing you can do with them. You cannot turn them into weak experts, right? A weak expert must be at least 51% correct, okay? Okay, so that'll be the point. So this talked about all the flipping and so on, okay? So the only time you can is when you're exactly 50% correct, okay? Okay, so now we know what our rich person is gonna do, okay? And so the rich person is going to Pick the first one first, then the second one, and so on. And uh, then at the end of the day, once they have picked their team of 50 experts or whatever, they're going to pay those 50 experts only, throw away the rest, not be concerned about the rest. And then from then on, face new days going forward, right? 
And of course, uh, you know, in all of these expert claims, I don't know those of you that have ever done anything with the stock market or plan to, uh, they will all tell you, all these experts will tell you, they will say our past performance is no guarantee about future success, right? And what they mean by that is that, and, and that's a true statement, and you'll see that on all stock market experts thing. They'll say, you know, our past performance is no sign, but then they'll tell you what their past performance was. They'll tell you, but by the way, we got Netflix when it was $1 and now it's $10,000 or something. So we would give you a million dollar, million percent improvement on what, you know, on Netflix, right? And then they'll cite their performance on Amazon and their performance on Microsoft and their performance on Apple. Of course, they won't tell you about all the losing stocks that they never told you about because all those losing stocks died so badly like Yahoo and so on and AOL and all those ones, right? So they won't tell you about that. They'll just tell you about the good stories. But then they'll tell you, you know, our future performance tomorrow is no guarantee based on our past success, right? Okay, and that's because uh, in the world of the stock market, uh, you're dealing with real life, right? Like suddenly, uh, like, like what has happened in the last uh, 10, 15, 20 years that has caused major downfalls in the stock market? And people, can people tell me what they know has been COVID. a problem? Like, COVID is one of them, right? COVID caused a big problem, right? The 2008 um, housing crisis. 2008 housing crisis. So 2008, uh, I'm suspecting most of you were barely born. Is that right? I mean, you were like five to 10 years old or something back then, right? Uh, so- Kind of, but I do remember seeing, like, I remember I was in a hotel somewhere and I remember seeing on CNN, $2 trillion lost or something, just like with no context. But I just remember seeing that headline that's kind of burned into my memory. <laughs> okay, and so you were probably six or seven years old at the time. And that's good that you have something burned into your memory that young. Uh, hopefully it'll be burned into your memory forever. Now, later on someday when we have chatting time, I'll ask you what you guys remember when you were three years old and four years old and so on, okay? Because I'm always curious about how human memory works, right? Uh, but anyway, so it is correct. The stock market crash of 2008, uh, what it was, was the uh, uh, major banks had given loans to people to buy homes uh, on the premise that you could give the loan to even people that were not going to take care of their finances properly, but you could give them a loan because it doesn't matter, the value of their home was going to keep rising. So it wouldn't matter if the person couldn't pay back the loan, they could at least have benefited from the fact that the home value went up. And so the bank would be holding a home that went up in value bigger than the value of the loan. So they were all thinking that way because the stock market, the value of homes had been going up for the previous five years, right? <laughs> and there was lots of incentives politically to get poor people to own their homes because the belief was the president at the time honestly believed that home ownership made people more responsible, right? So the point was uh, they were doing that, the banks were doing all that. And then suddenly, it all got caught in a jam where these poor people were not able to pay back their loans. Interest rates, interest rates kept rising and so on. They weren't able to, to handle that at all. So they started choking on their paying back. Then suddenly there was a flood of these homes on the market that were to be sold. Then that caused housing prices to drop. That caused a further acceleration of the problem anyway. So the bottom line, there was a big housing crash. And maybe some of you were victims of that, uh, in which case your family's home dropped in value to 50%. Maybe you lost your home or whatever. Uh, there were real people that lost their homes in the in the bargain, and were you know, etc. That caused a problem in the economy. Banking employees you know, lost their jobs, etc. So major problems. So the whole stock market crashed. Right at the time, there were other crashes in life. There was the 2000, uh, late 2000, early 2001. There was a crash. It was called the tech technology bubble, uh, which is kind of happening now again. So people have to be worried about similar things going on. That was the idea that stock market companies were forming and rich people were giving them lots of money to start new companies and so on. And poor people were also giving them lots of money that poor people didn't have the money, but they took loans to give them the money. Believing that these companies, tech companies were gonna make a profit and were gonna make them rich. So they bought stocks in these no-name companies. Uh, and then these no-name companies delivered nothing. And so their stocks started crashing. The poor people lost their money, banks lost their money. And then that further caused a further crash of the market. And that was the crash of 2000, 2001, okay? So there've been crashes like that that caused massive things to happen, right? Uh, what would cause a crash today? Like if, what kind of event in the world today would cause the stock market to crash? What do you think? Just just speculate, and it doesn't matter if you're correct. Just say stupid things to me. 
Elon Musk just... opening Twitter. <laughs> what did what did the other students say besides the Elon Musk comment? Who who else said? Something? Can He's, the other students? Uh, yeah. A stock market bots that um, sort of got caught in a feedback loop and really like push. Yeah, sometimes there's that the body bots. thing. Sometimes there's that body thing going on, but I think now they have it under control. They don't allow the bots to perform that much of operations. There's some control on the bots, so it's not so. So if something starts changing too fast, they freeze the stock market and say, "Okay, we're shutting down the market for an hour until everything cools down." So that won't cause a major problem on its own. Okay, but what other world events would cause this problem? Other than COVID, there's also Reddit go getting together and shooting GameStop to the moon. Yeah, but that's just one particular, a couple of stocks or something. That's not the whole market crashing. Or something. Um, I, I got that. War. What, sorry, what did that speak up? Uh, war. Yeah, war breaking out for sure, right? And wars could be multiple types. Uh, there could be the situation with North Korea uh, launching a missile against the US or against South Korea or something like that. Uh, there's threats, of course, constantly in the Middle East that's always been going on for the last 20, 50 years. Uh, there's always a potential for war breaking out there and could be nuclear any day. So whatever, if anything like that happened, the market's going to have some reaction to it, right? Okay. So the point is these experts are supposed to have known that, right? Uh, meaning that's what we're trusting them for, but they're saying don't trust us that much because we cannot know who's going to start a war tomorrow, right? Which is true. But under normal conditions, they'll make their predictions and then hopefully... Uh, so, so this is now non-training, right? This is now the rich person has actually hired these people to make money for the rich person. So we're talking about employing them tomorrow and the day after and so on. So that's called testing, okay? Meaning the training stage was when you use the data from what you know the answers to be, you know the correct answers, and so you'll be able to judge whether they did correctly or not. In the testing stage, you won't know it, and you're screwed if you fail, right? Meaning you lose your money if you fail, but that's what testing is, okay? So that's the stock market world. Now, in our world, uh, of vision, remember I started out showing you the first slide was you wanna take these images with faces in them and find where the faces are, right? So what it is is you're gonna have a scanning, uh, some fixed box size, 50 by 50 or something like that, fixed boxes, you're gonna scan it along. And each time along, you're gonna send that 50 by 50 box of picture into your algorithm and the algorithm is gonna tell you whether or not that's a face or not, right? That's the point of this algorithm, okay? That we're shooting towards, right? So how are we gonna train up an algorithm like that in the same way that the stock market, stock market algorithm did? Well, so what we're gonna have is some vision experts, uh, expert one, expert two, expert three. I'll tell you in a moment what these experts are, but for now, just assume that we can call them expert one, expert two, expert three, and so on, all the way up to expert N. Uh, we will have our training data which is pictures of faces and pictures of non-faces, right? So pictures of faces, I've drawn some here in my feeble attempt at art. Uh, my, my, my art is by the way, one of the worst in the world, okay? Uh, both in my ability to draw, my ability to put together colors is very horrible. My PowerPoint presentations are the worst in the world. I always steal from other people because I have no way to generate artistic ones myself. Uh, my walls, both in my office and my home, are horrible. My car looks like 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 a dungeon somewhere. Okay, so whatever. The fact is, I'm I'm an artistic complete uh, 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 loser. Okay. Uh, later on, I'll tell you some stories about my actual life as a kid and so on, and how I failed in art class and so on. But but whatever. So the point is, uh, this is my attempt at at uh, a set of database of faces. Normally, these faces I've gotten for real. From, from where do you think they get these stash of faces for these training databases? Where do you think they get them from? Scraping social Facebook. Social media? Uh, you could do it from social media and scrape, scraping and so on, but that's a lot of work. There's a cheap way to just go and buy them. For like $10, you can buy a million faces. Where do they get them from? There's like the celebrity faces data set, I think. Okay, but all those things are, are more There's recent. Like stock, okay. stock uh, image. Things. Yeah, so all those things are recent, okay? So the way faces used to be gotten was from the DMVs, okay? The DMVs used to sell everybody's faces, right? Oh. And that's been going on for the last 50 years, okay? So, but of course they sell them without identities, right? So they don't put your name on it. So it's legal to do it. Uh, if they sell it with your name, then there's a problem, right? There's a whole privacy issue and you can sue them and so on. 
but if we sell it just as an example of a human face for training a database, then it's okay, right? So they all do that and they would sell it by uh, different racial groups and different age groups and different gender groups and uh, people with two noses and that kind of thing. Uh, they would sell all of that. You know, they have categories of databases that you can buy from them, okay? Uh, but anyway, so you have your generic database over here of faces, and then you have your generic database of non-faces. And this is meant to be an artwork piece of a tree. It's an artwork piece of a car and so on, okay? So you have your databases. Now, I'm gonna tell you how to create an expert, right? So uh, you start out with one of these four families of patterns. You see how these are different kinds of patterns. These are two vertical bars, a white bar and a black bar adjacent to each other. These are two horizontal bars, a black bar and a white bar. These are three vertical bars, uh, two positive uh, uh, white bars on the side and a black bar in the middle. And of course you could have the opposite. You could have a, a white bar in the middle and two blacks on the side and so on. And then you can get these checkerboard like black white bar pattern okay so there's these four families of patterns why are they families because uh i could simul let's take that first family that i have up there uh this is also an example of the same family okay as is this one Okay, do you see why all these three, this one, this one and this one are all part of the same family? Yeah, hopefully it's obvious, right? Okay, so the point is they're part of the same family and by different placements of where I put the, the smaller box, where I put the center of the smaller box, where I put it, by different placements, by different placements of its size, right? How wide it is, or by different placements of how tall it is, right? I get different family members, right? So it turns out I can get thousands upon thousands of family members if I have a 50 by 50 table size, okay? Now, why do I get 50 by 50? Because these were all 50 by 50. And these were all 50 by 50. Okay, so my world is a 50 by 50 world, right? Okay, 50 by 50 pixels, okay? So, I started with this pattern, one such pattern. Now I'm gonna just talk about one expert for now, okay? Then you can generalize to other experts later on, right? So I started with one pattern. Let's say I pick this pattern here, okay? So this is my pattern I'm gonna work, I'm sorry. This is my pattern I'm gonna work with, okay? So I know it's 50 by 50, right? I know that, uh, oh, well, I, there's one little detail I, I did not tell you yet about the pattern. So it turns out this red part of the pattern is actually a bunch of zeros. Zeros. The white part of the pattern is a bunch of plus ones. And the rest of the background pattern is, sorry, 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 this is not zeros. This is minus ones. This is minus ones, this is plus one, and the background here is a bunch of zeros. Okay, so what I mean by that again is, this is zeros. This is minus ones, many minus ones, right? In, in, that, in that rectangle area. Jeez, sorry about that. Something's wrong. Uh, use a pen. Okay. So uh, minus ones, and then this is my plus ones, right? Okay. We clear on what these tables look like now. Okay. So I will now uh, consider the number line. Okay. The number line just allows me to plot things from a negative infinity to plus infinity, right? Okay. 
So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, take my uh, my pattern, my that expert pattern that I chose, and I'm going to convolve it with my first face, first database face, right? And I'll get some number from it. Okay. Now let me ask you: uh, Do you understand? I've got a face. and a pattern, right? My pattern is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. <coughs> then I have a plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. You, you realize that's my pattern, right? Okay, that's the pattern I'm working with, a bunch of zeros around it, everywhere else. I've got a quick question. Go ahead. You, you said in the pattern on the last slide that there could be like a, a white bar going through it as well. Like, am, am I misunderstanding something? In the pattern on the left side, you mean this pattern here? No, so in the, the, the negative ones, you could have, you said a, a white bar, so I guess it'd be a ones going through it. Well, that would be another no 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 that would be a different family that would be this oh, family. oh okay 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 so These we're are four different families this, right we're talking about no. this particular family yeah i'm dealing i'm dealing with this family here oh, okay so i don't have this situation okay right? i i got confused sorry yeah no no yeah i'm i'm restricting myself to only this pattern here okay i chose one family member right so that family member looks like this right okay i chose this this table okay so now this is 50 by 50, right? <coughs> and this is 50 by 50, right? Okay, so can you tell me um, what is the convolution result gonna look like? First of all, what is my what what am I gonna get from that convolution, that one location convolution that I'm gonna do? I'm gonna convolve the face in a one location convolution with the table. What am I going to get from it? Yeah, uh, you're just going to like cut out a section of the face. That's fine. That's fine. But what is what am I ultimately going to get from it? After cutting out and doing everything you told me to want to do, what am I going to ultimately get? What is the definition of convolution? My three steps are what? Embed, embed a notion of zeros, do the double flip, and then come back and do the weighted sum and so on, right? But I'm asking you for a one location convolution. So I don't need the double flip and I don't need the ocean of zeros. I just want to place this table over this table and I want to do my calculation. What do I get for the answer? Is it just one number? Correct. It's a Correct. one location. That's what I'm looking as for your answer from you, just to say one number, right? Correct. It's one number. Okay. Now, the point about that one number is: can I say whether it's positive or negative? It could be either because you have both positive and negative weights in the convolution. Very good. Very good answer. Yeah. Uh, in my face numbers, do I have any negative numbers in the face? Likely no. Not allowed to, right? Because my images are all positive numbers, right? My tables of images are all positive numbers, okay? So I'm not allowed to have any negative numbers here, but here I have positive and negative numbers. And so I don't know where the positive and negative numbers are gonna fall in relation to the table here, right? I don't know that. So I don't know whether my one number that I get back is gonna end up here or here. I don't know that. And it doesn't matter. I'm just going to say in mathematics, say without loss of generality, I'm going to put my number over here. Okay. So now I go to my next one, my next face. So that was my first face. This is my second face. This might be my third face. This might be my fourth face. This might be my fifth face, sixth face, seventh face, eighth face, and so on. Uh, by the way, why do I get these guys stacking up on top of each other? Why am I showing? What, what is going on there? 
what explanation is it for that part of the figure? Wouldn't that be images that have similar parts, like similar things? Correct. So I ended up with the same convolution result, right? So I showed it as stacked up on top of each other, okay? Uh, but really what that is, that's a frequency, right? That means I got that number that often, right? Okay, it's a frequency thing, right? Uh, is this so, an XY plot? This is not an XY plot. This is a uh, plot of integers. I'm going from negative infinity integers to positive infinity integers. And my height is just the frequency. Wouldn't this just be a histogram? Yes, it is a histogram. Okay. Uh, then what is like the black bar doing in the middle? The black bar is just to separate the negative answers from the positive answers. Okay. Yeah, it's not really a plot in that sense. Okay. But I'm glad you asked about the black bar. This is very good, right? Uh, who asked that question, by the way? Who asked about the black bar? Uh, me, Zane. Okay, very good. Thank you, Zane. Okay, so it turns out I can't, I can't see, as I said, I can't see everybody's face on my screen, so I don't know who asked what. But I'm glad you did. So, you know, very, very important that you are that honest about the confusing levels, okay? Be very, very honest. Everything will become much clearer. As I said, for every person who asks a question, I know that there are three or four people who would have asked the same question but don't feel confident enough to ask it. And that's not good, okay? You need to develop that confidence to ask because I'm sure you are as confused as whoever was confused about this black bar in the middle, okay? Because it doesn't mean that my figures are perfect, right? Okay, my figures are what I came up with. I don't explain everything and so on. So you're confused. You need to clarify that confusion, okay? So I'm glad you asked the question. So this is basically just a histogram, okay? Now, so this is for all of my faces, okay? I've done all my faces now and my histogram looks something like this, right? This is a distribution of my results, right? Okay, that little red profile is my distribution, okay? Now I start bringing in the non-faces. Non-faces with the trees and the cars and the cell phones and, and everything else. It turns out uh, in my own uh, picture, and I don't know right now if you can all see me or not, uh, but, but let's assume you can. Then in my own picture, hey, and I actually have a framey thing over here. I didn't mean to plan to have this, but I do have a frame by accident over here in my office. I'm gonna use that for my bed right now. Okay. So if this, okay, well, the frame may be too big. Uh, let me see if I have a smaller frame than this. Okay, hang on. No, I don't, uh, I don't simply have a smaller frame. So instead, I'll have to imagine that there's a frame. Uh, imagine this is my, okay, well, it's still too big. Something like that. Uh, let's find a, oh, I can just fold it. In. Okay, so imagine this is the frame, right? This is the box, okay? And you're moving the box across my image. So it's first up here. Then what should the, what should the, the, the algorithm say? It should say no face, right? You can make it even smaller than that. Okay. It should say no face there, right? Then I move the box over here, it should say no face, it should say no face, no face, no face, no face. Now when it's directly over my face and I get that box, should it say face or not? What should it say? Should say face. It should say face, right? Then what about this one? Half my face, should it say face or not face? It should still say face. Should be close to face. No, so there is no close to face. It's either gonna say face or not face, right? Face. So the point is, it'll say no. When it's half my face, it's gonna say no, okay? When it's this half, it's going to say no. When it's this half, it's going to say no, and so on. So most of the time, it's saying no, okay? It's very rarely saying yes, just when it's over my actual face, right? So what I'm trying to tell you is that these red non-faces include half-body pictures and half-faces and so on, and cell phones and cars and trees and books and all your background images and so on, okay? So that's fine. So now I plotted them. Now I will go and I will now do, uh, so I'll draw the two humps, right? The black hump and the red hump, okay? Now my job is to find a threshold, okay? 
a threshold is a dividing line, uh, like that black line that I had there. Imagine I could move that black line, right? Uh, but I still want to mark that as a zero over there. Okay, I mean that number should still be zero there, right? I still want to be known that that this is zero. Okay, but now I want to be able to find a threshold. A threshold is another line like this, or like this, or like this, or like this, and so on, such that once I determine that threshold that's going to give me the least amount of wrong people on the wrong side of the line. And what do I mean by that? I mean, that, for example, uh, if I were to, so let me for a moment erase all of my ink. Okay. So let me go ahead and uh, uh, imagine that my line was here. Okay. And the job of this line is to help me do classification, right? So that means that I want to label one side of the line with one name, black or red, faces or non-faces, and the other side of the line with the other name. Okay, that's the reason I'm coming up with this line, right? This line is a threshold, okay? So uh, if I had put the line, my threshold over here, then what would I label this side? What would I call it? Faces. Faces on the black side, right? And what would I call this side? Non-faces. Non-faces on the red side, right? Okay, correct, okay? So now the point is, if I call that faces, and this is all non-faces, then what about these black values here? Those are um, all my- you... Oh, sorry. sorry. Those are all my error, right? Those are my error. Those are the ones I'm gonna be calling them non-faces when they're really faces, right? Okay? So I need you to understand that no matter where I place this line, I always have some error as long as I have overlapping histograms, right? The only time I don't have any error is when my two histograms are nicely separated out like that, right? If they're nicely separated out like that, then I have no error at all, but then I don't have a realistic problem. Meaning most problems have confusion, right? Very rarely a problem so clean that I don't have to. If, if I had a problem that needed no, that had no confusion, then I don't need any of this stuff. I don't need any of this machine learning or anything, okay? Okay, so the point is, I typically have this error. What I'm trying to do is to find the placement of the threshold such that I minimize my error. So I want to be able to find this spot here where I will have the least error on this side and the least error on this side, right? That's what I'm looking for, okay? Um, so I run a pretty simple search algorithm. I'll place my error here. I'll see, uh, I'll, I'll place my threshold here. I'll see what is my error. I'll place it here. I'll see what is my error. I'll place my threshold here. I'll see what's my error. I'll place it here. I'll place it here. I'll place it here. I'll keep placing, 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 placing until I find the minimum error, right? And then I'll, I'll stop with that. Well, I'll go, I'll go on both sides. I'll go this side and I'll go that side. And I'll figure out that this was the minimum error I got. And then I'll quit, right? I'll quit. That's my answer to the minimum error, okay? So that now becomes my threshold. And so it turns out that my expert is basically the original pattern. Plus this threshold choice that I picked, plus the polarity, which is the fact that I call this the faces. That's a polarity. Sometimes they call it parity. Totally different reasons. The words sound the same, but they're totally different different meanings. But in the art problem, they're very similar. Okay, so faces and this is the non-faces side, right? Okay, so those three factors, the pattern, the threshold, and which side I call what is my expert. You all buy that now that, that I now have an expert? Because now you come in with a new test image for me, one that I never saw before, just like a new stock market day, right? I never saw the stock market day before. Now you're coming with a new image for me and I'm supposed to tell you whether that's a face or not a face. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll take my convolution pattern, I'll convolve it with my new picture that you gave me, right? Presumably it's also 50 by 50. I'm only allowed to accept 50 by 50 pictures. You give me a 50 by 50 picture, I will convolve it with this pattern. I'll look at where the answer lies either on this side of the threshold or that side of the threshold and I'll tell you whether it's a face or non-face, that's it. 
That's how I perform as an expert. And when I run my original databases through my system, I get this amount of error, right? This is my error that I'm getting right here. And that error is what makes me a weak expert because it's less than 50%, but it's not less than 99%, okay? So that's, uh, 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 not less than 1%, I should say, okay? So my error is between 50 and 1%, between 49 and 1%, and that makes me a weak expert, right? Okay, so that's how we get an expert in this process. Are you all pretty clear on what these experts are doing now? I got a question. I, I, I suspect you'll answer it in the future, but um, how would you get the, uh, the experts to work together? Like, okay, so yeah, that 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 is a good good point. So it turns out each time I select in this selection algorithm process, selecting an expert, selecting an expert, selecting an expert each time. Remember, the experts are being selected according to their complementing the existing team so far, right? Each time I select an expert, there is a, a weight that gets associated with the, with the expert about how much of the bad examples, bad examples are ones that nobody can solve so far, okay? How much of the bad examples has it killed? And that weight goes associated with it, right? With the expert being chosen. Then at the end, it's a simple tug of war. At the end, I have, let's say my team size of 50, right? My team size of 50 now simply goes on to uh, look at a new image and it'll break up into two sets of answers. Those that say, yes, it's a face and those that say, no, it's not a face, right? Each of the ones that say, yes, it's a face, I put them on one side. Each of the ones that say, no, it's not a face, I put them on the other side. I add up the weights on the one side, add up the weights on the other one, the heavier team wins. So okay. by by that uh, way of doing things, then you, you're required to have as many as as you can that function properly. Because if you have too few, then the ones that are supposed to counteract to, to complement, they won't add up to enough to uh, to function, right? Well, that's a good point. So the question is really. Uh, what happens when I, my team member is only three, right? Only three team members. What happens when my team member becomes five? What happens when my team size becomes seven and nine and eight and so on, right? As I grow, right? So what ends up happening is that um, the overall team is also kind of performing with the same pattern that we got here, okay? So let me just erase everything for a moment. Wait, sorry. I used the wrong erase. Erase all the ink. Okay, my overall team is also got patterns like this, okay? Meaning even though I told you this was the pattern for a single expert, I told you this was the pattern for a single expert, right? That's what I told you. I said, this is the way a single expert looks, right? That's what I said. But in reality, this is also how a team looks. A team also has, uh, you know, team behavior is this. I get, I get some that I'm gonna get correct, some that I'm gonna get wrong, right? And some that I'll get wrong in between. I, I mean, some that I'll say yes to, some that I'll say no to, in between I'll get some wrong, right? So what happens is that initially, let's say this was my very first expert I had, okay? My very first expert, right? So that very first expert also is my who? What's another name for that first expert of mine? Is it the highest accuracy one? No, no, it won't be the highest accuracy. We don't know who's gonna be more, that, that'll change itself over time. No, the thing is, but what about it? What about it? It's also my team at this point in time, right? Because it's the only member of my team, right? So it's both an, my first expert, but it's also my team, okay? Now, if it's my team, then what is my team error at this point? What is whatever it the, error the expert is? Yeah, so it's whatever I'm showing in the figure here, right? It's this red region and this black region here, right? So what do you estimate that to be out of my total area? About 20%? 
Yes. Maybe a little more, but yeah. So maybe 25%, right? 20, 25%. Okay. So that means my team error right now is about, let's say 23%. Okay. We pick a number, right? 23%. Okay. Now what happens when I bring in the second team member? I should be getting more correct now, right? So what ends up happening to these, my team curve is my team curve is now splitting apart. It's pulling apart. And the next time I bring another team member is gonna pull apart even more and so on, right? Now I've shown it very fastly decreasing error over here, which is not correct, right? The error decreases by half a percent each time. Not even half a percent. Sometimes it's one hundredth of a percent or something. We, we can't predict how much it's gonna decrease, but it will keep decreasing because my team is getting better, right? So you asked me, what if my team is insufficient, you said, right? What if my team is too small, you said, right? Right? So of course, I need to keep going until I achieve 99.9% .9 correctness. Otherwise, there's no point. So I grow my team. So there's no guarantee that 50 team members will do it, right? In reality, I don't stop at 50. In reality, I stop at 99.9% .9 correctness. And it turns out, by the way, that in reality for the face detection algorithm, they found that for an employee database of like 20,000 employees or something like that, or 100,000 employees, you need to have a team size of at least 300, 400. Not 50 like I was talking about earlier, okay? So that's the story on that. Um, let me... See, so have most of you kept up with what this algorithm was trying to do and so on and how it starts to act as a team later on and the tug of war between the two sides, right? I believe so. Um, so quick question. Um, so this is still the results from one pattern on applied to our uh, database of images, correct? No, but that's just the first team member, right? That's the one I was saying is down here, the lower part of the image. This is mm -hmm. the first team member. This is one pattern, right? Mm -hmm. Then I will consider all my patterns. So then I'll pick my second team member from all my patterns. Oh, okay. So like we make one of these, I guess, double for histograms each, for each pattern for all patterns. Okay. Yes. And then, and then we kind of like then, weight them together. Yeah, and then and then and then of course as the first team member, I will have picked the one with the smallest bad area here, right? Mm -hmm. That's my first team member, right? My second team member is not picked pictorially like that. I have to go in carefully and look at who these wrong ones were, right, from the first team member. And then I have to see who of the remaining pool of experts is killing those wrong ones the most, right? Okay, just to remember the two histograms, one is for faces and one is for non-faces, right? Correct, this is, but, but this is for a particular expert, right? Yeah. Right? This is for a particular expert, right? So I'll have, if I have, uh, what did I say, number of experts? I said 10,000 experts or something? So, or, or I said 1,000 experts. Uh, uh, yeah, I said 10,000 experts, okay? In reality, for face detection problem, I get around 800,000 experts because my patterns can be, my patterns like this and this and this and this and all these different placements and so on can generate about 800,000 patterns in a 50 by 50 grid. It's close to a million, basically. Okay. I get a million experts this way, right? So what I'm telling you is that you have a million such, such histograms, right? And of course, this histogram thing is only good in order to pick the threshold for that expert. And then it's good to pick my first expert, right? Because it'll be the one with the least area over here, right? But after that, I can no longer use that area as a criteria to decide how to pick an expert. I have to go back and track each one of these guys who have been gotten wrong over here. I have to put them in a team like this, put them in a team like this, look at all the wrongs that the team is getting. And then I have to see who is beating those wrong ones the most and so on. Okay, you, you don't need to worry about the implementation of how they do that. There's some funny way they do it with weights, a different set of weights and all that. They weight these examples that are wrong, they give them weights and their weights grow the wronger they are over time and so on. And then that means that 
the expert has less of a penalty because the expert got it wrong and so on. Or, or if the expert gets it wrong, it has a higher penalty. So, okay, whatever, there's some specific algorithm, but what I told you is the right way to think about it, which is that you're always thinking about complementing the team so far, okay? So are you all kind of basically clear with the general algorithm then being done here, okay? Uh, I have a quick question about the, the pattern that we're using for this. Yes, yes. Um, I guess I'm still a little bit confused on what the significance of that pattern shape is. And how ah, very good point. Very good point. Very good point. Very good point. So let me tell you one thing they claimed, okay? These people who invented this algorithm, uh, I will have to step out for a moment, step out of this whole thing. Uh, I have to shut down my PowerPoint. I have to go to a... Uh, uh, so can you still see my screen? I'm on a, on, a, on a Google thing. I'm doing a Google search. Can you all see me do that? Yes? Okay. Uh, so, yeah. I'm type, so I'm going to type in the name of that paper and it was Viola Jones. Viola Jones Real-Time Robust Object Detection. I'm going to pull up that paper. Okay, so this was the original paper, okay? I'm just gonna scroll down it fast because I wanna take you to a spot in the paper. Okay, so these were the patterns and so on, right? The patterns, okay. They claimed that their first two experts were these. They claimed this was the most popular, the best expert, first one, this one. Do you all see it? And this was their second one. Now, what you can see, now I should tell, I, I use the word claim because nobody else has ever gotten that result, okay? Like, like other people have trained on databases and don't get these two as the first two, right? Okay, they get, they get you know, some other combinations of patterns. Okay. No one cares what they are as long as the whole system works, right? But you're asking, what does it mean to be an expert and why does it do it and so on? So now you're able to see what's going on is that a normal face looks like this. It has a dark region for the eyes generally, right? It's very rarely the case, even a, a dark skinned person like myself, uh, and even darker than me, will still have this pattern where, because my brows are dark, right? Uh, I'm gonna get a dark band in this part of my head over here and a lighter band down there. So that's what the convolution is looking for. It's looking for something that it matches, right? And so here it's matching this, you know, people always have this, this, this white area here is the nose bridge, you know, the top of my nose over here, the bridge of the nose. So that area generally for 99% of the population is lighter in the bridge in the middle than on the eyes on the border because the eyes are normally darker and so on, right? Okay. So that's kind of what goes on in these pattern things. So obviously uh, if you have a bunch of people with beards in the face, and I notice in our group, one or two people have beards in the group, right? So if it was a face database made up of us in this in this REU and so on, then you need to have, uh, then probably the algorithm would be looking for beardness. So there'd be something over here in this part of the face that would look for, you know, is it darker than the skin color or whatever, right? Except of course, when you get older, then your beard is white and your skin color is darker normally. Then you then you so then it reverses but whatever you know there'd be something like that looking for beardness and so on okay so whatever so do you get a sense uh, Sanjay about what these patterns are now and why they why they matter yeah so the resulting number that you get from the convolution is basically how well the regions of lightness and darkness match up with those patterns uh, yeah that's what the true answer is that's the true answer you're correct. Uh, but of course, uh, it could be a negative. It could be a negative number that could be quite high as well. Right? Okay. But I don't want you. It, it's a good thing to ask that specific question that you asked. But I think it's more important to just know that uh, what you're dealing with is the story. And I, I don't know if I saved my PowerPoint. Or I lost it. Oh no, I saved it. That's good. Okay, uh, the thing to know that you're dealing with is that, uh, so, so can you still see my screen? I've gone back to the patterns, right? I can still see. 
you can still see me, right? My screen with the patterns, right? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay, so what, what we're dealing with is uh, this situation that that we have our experts uh, done with these with these histograms. Okay, that's what you really want to know. Is that so? It's not just the excellence of the match between the pattern and the and the face, but it's the excellence of the. Uh, uh, because by the way, it's not just about faces, right? Uh, what if the whole world, what if all the other objects in the world all had that band around my eyes? Okay. What if all other objects in the world also always had that pattern? Right. Then that would be a very weak indicator of a face, right? Because everything in the world has it as do the human faces have it. So it's useless as a discriminator, right? So really what's going on is that it's not just what's in the face, it's what's in the face plus what is in the non-faces. And you've got to take both of them together and find the right discriminator. And that's what this is doing. It's discriminating between the two kinds of cases and that's the issue, okay? So remember, you could have this, this pattern thing, uh, run on, I believe you can run it to match people with beards and people without beards, right? That should be pretty easy to decide how that would work, right? It would have all the boxes drawn around people's beard area, right? Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if you can also use it to do gender, okay? To do uh, male and female faces separately without considering people's hair, without considering people's facial hair. Uh, so uh, back in the day, uh, when I first started my job here, I did. I actually was the pioneer to do work on aging people's faces. So if you Google the first person to do face aging, my name will come up, right? And I have the patent on 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 that approach. Um, and what we were just doing was uh, looking at babies whose faces, it turns out, are not elongated, and the lower part of their face hasn't grown yet. So their eyes are in the middle of the head right, for babies. And then as you grow older, your face grows longer, your jaws drop and so on. And then the third group of age we looked at was senior citizens who have wrinkles on their face, right? So we were just using very primitive sort of things back then to classify age and so on. And so, but as part of that work, um, we wanted to look at uh, ages of people without facial hair. And so we got lots of back, this was like, you know, 30 years ago, uh, before there was a lot of digital faces and so on. So we went through books of things. And one of the books we had was a books on just models of real model people and shaved heads, right? So they were all like, as though they were cancer victims, which they weren't, they were just models, shaved heads, right? And believe it or not, looking at each one of those model faces, you could always tell if it was a male or a female. Now, I think today the life is more complicated with the whole transgender thing and all that going on. But back then there's something about the male pattern face, which is different from the female pattern face, okay? So whatever. So, so that means that these experts would not just be looking for eyes and so on, but they'd be looking, these expert patterns would be looking for whatever lets it discriminate, right? Whatever, whatever lets it tell the difference, okay? That's the key idea, okay? So that's it. And then you can obviously tell smiling faces from frowning faces and all that. All of that's possible in this game. And people have these machine learning techniques for doing all those kinds of things as well, okay? So that's the story. Now, uh, this particular method that I told you about it's called the Viola Jones method. I just took you to the original paper and all that. But it turns out now it's very stale, even though it's only 20 years old, it's stale. Up till about seven years ago, it was still pretty hot. And uh, when students learned it in my class and so on, they'd go on job interviews and people would be very impressed. Wow, you know, you actually know the boosting algorithm and so on. And they'd say, yeah, we know it, we understand it. We work with code for it and so on. Uh, today it's stale and people will just yawn when they hear about that, right? And that's because uh, what has happened in the last uh, 10 years or so is the growth of a new machine learning technique. It's not really new. It's actually one of the oldest ones of all, but it's uh, blown up suddenly to be really, really effective. And it's the one based on neural networks, okay? So uh, what I want you to do later on, once we understand neural networks, I want you to come back to this approach that we did in boosting 
And I want us to think about what the major differences are, right? But for now, then let me take you to the, to the neural network slides so that we can work on them, right? So I am jumping now to uh, my set of slides number RU8, okay? So in RU8, Uh, we start talking about a basic neuron. And so in a basic neuron, we have uh, these input values coming into the neuron. Okay, in this case, uh, my input's only two inputs. So it's an input vector, but the vector has two quantities. Okay, and now our vectors are gonna be much longer than just two and all that. And we won't talk about magnitudes of vectors. We just talk about vectors being long lists of numbers, right? Okay, so, for now, we'll talk about a very, very simple notion of a neuron. And then later on, we'll look at how our neural network could have handled a face as its input, okay? But for now, we're not dealing with a face. For now, we're dealing with some simple list of numbers, right? So in this case, the list of numbers is just two numbers, number two and number five coming into the neuron. And so then the neuron has these weights on these arrows, right? And what it means to have the weights on the arrows is that the inputs are gonna be multiplied by those weights. And then you're gonna sum them up on the inside over here, okay? So we go to that next. Okay, and then um, they often also include something called a bias term, which I'll talk about that later on, what that means. For now, you just need to know it's in the calculation there somewhere, okay? It'll come into the story. And now, we will show you what the calculation is, right? So the calculation is the first weight times the first input value plus the second weight times the second input value plus just the bias term, okay? That is my result from the calculation, okay? So this is my calculation here. And given these values that I had up here, my actual calculation would be these numbers, right? And then given that those numbers can be added up, I get my final answer to be this. Okay, so that's my very first step in the neural network. I got some inputs. I had a bias term as though it was an input. I have some weights on these arrows. In this one, the implication is what is the weight on this arrow here? What is the implication? If it's being added up with its full value without a weight on it, then, then what is the weight of one? The weight is one, right? Okay, make sure that you're understanding those kinds of mathematical concepts, right? that if I'm using the full value in the summation, then that means its weight must be one, right? Okay. So uh, I got my Z value over here, which is the quantity of the total, total summation, right? And now I'll go on to my next slide, which tells me that now what I want to do is, I want to run a, uh, I want to take that Z and I want to feed it through what is called, they call it an activation function, but really, the key idea is that it's a nonlinearity process, okay? What you're doing is, what you've done so far in this calculation here is something called linear. Now, I don't know how many of you know exactly the difference between linear and nonlinear equations and so on. So I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on that, telling you about that. So see, in a, in a linear process, if I double my inputs, if I double my X vector over here, if I double the values of my X vector, then what do I expect in my output here to be? The output will also double? Correct, right? And that's because it's a linear process because my weights are the same in all three cases, but I doubled my two to be four, I doubled my five to be 10, and I doubled my 0.1 to be 0.2, right? I doubled everything here coming in. If I double my inputs, then I expect my Z over here to be minus 0.2. Eight. Okay, that's what a that's what it means to be linear. Okay, linear means uh, I had a weighting extra weighting factor of two, and that extra weighting factor shows up in the output as well. Okay, so uh, and linear equations. Uh, there's a whole set of topics in the classes and all you can take later on matrix algebra class and all that that deals with linear equations because linear equations are important in their own right. Okay, for their own world. Uh, but for us, we just wanna know what's the difference between linear and nonlinear for now, okay? Now, on the other hand, 
if instead of just simply multiplying the x1 by w1, if I was to square it first, or to take the sine of it, or the cosine of it, or the tangent of it, or the exponentiation of it, or the polynomial of it, or whatever, then I no longer expect a linear response over here, right? I no longer expect it to be linear. I don't longer expect it to be, I double the inputs, therefore I'll double my output. I don't know what's gonna to happen to my output. Now my output could blow up. It could blow up exponentially. It could be a sinusoid function that, with a sine function, you know, I can double my inputs and I keep going around in circles, right? I, I can double, quadruple my inputs, go 50 times my inputs. I still go around in circles with a sine function, right? So there's no growth. My sine function doesn't increase just because my input increased. It's the opposite. It keeps going around in circles, right? Okay, it's a cyclical kind of thing, okay? So whatever it is, I don't know what my nonlinearity is, but whatever nonlinear behavior I have, it's not linear. And so uh, I, I would have to deal with that, right? As a nonlinear behavior, right? Now, uh, what is interesting about uh, vision problems is that if, um, if, the, uh, if the story was that these numbers coming in are the pixels of my face, right? If it was my face pixels coming in here as a ve long vector, I strung my whole face up into a long vector, a long list of numbers, and I brought them in this way. Then if I double the brightness of my face, so doubling the brightness of my face means I made every pixel twice as bright, right? All that means is my face looked much lighter than it is now against the background and so on, right? That's all I did. Then when I finish my calculation here, do I expect to say that this is twice Niels? Does it make sense to say that this is twice Niels? It doesn't, right? I'm still the same Niels, right? So that means that vision is not a linear process. When we see an object, we're not, doubling the input doesn't make us doubly confident that that's the object, not at all, has no bearing whatsoever. That means there's some non-linearity going on in the process. Okay, now um, in this game that we're gonna to play today for the rest of the day today, uh, we're going to realize that the way this neural network is gonna work is we're gonna feed this Z number through a nonlinear calculation here. And that's gonna be our answer A. The nonlinear calculation in our case is this one down here, okay? This mess down here. Uh, one divided by one plus e to the minus z, right? That z was the quantity we got from here. Now we feed that z into here, in, into this quantity here, and we get a sigma of z, and that sigma is what we report as the answer a out here, and that's the answer coming out of our arrow over here, okay? So now uh, the story is this, see? You take my face, string it up as a bunch of pixels over here and um you no so so these are the pixels over here for me the two and the five and so on are my face values right all my face values then i have these weights that came from nowhere i got them out from the middle of nowhere right i told you some weights and then i came up with this value z then i fed z through some nonlinear calculation and i got some number back out here i want that number to mean to mean lobo right, to me, Niels Lobo. Now, instead I take Michael Brown and Michael Brown comes in with his face numbers over here. He goes through the same weights as I had over here, goes to the same nonlinear calculation here, comes up with a different number. I want that number that comes up from Michael Brown to be a number that I agreed upon Michael Brown should come out with, just as I agreed that Niels Lobo should come out with another number, okay? So to the extent that Michael Brown's number and Niels Lobo's numbers do not come out correctly. I want that difference between the correct number and the wrong number that came out. I want that difference for Niels Lobo, what is the wrong number that came out and the correct number that it should have been. I want that difference to be pulled aside. Then I wanna figure out how did each one of these weights contribute to that total error so that I can go back and I can now distribute that error to correct each one of my weights. Okay, I wanna correct my weights. When I correct my weights repeatedly, 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 I'll finally have good enough weights 
that will generate when I put in the Niels Lobo face values in here in the vector, input vector, my weights will suddenly have now magically become the correct weights they should be. And going through this whole process, I'll get the number that I wanted for Niels Lobo out here. Okay. And it turns out along the way, because I've used Michael Brown in the training as well, gone back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, change the weights, change the weights, change the weights to satisfy both Niels Lobo and Michael Brown's requirements. It'll also work well for Michael Brown. I'll put Michael Brown's numbers in here and they will come out here with the number that Michael Brown wanted. Okay, so that's what's going on in this neural networks approach. And I would just be changing the weights according to uh, the dependence on the error on each one of these weights. Okay, according to what the dependence is, I would update the weights. Okay, now what I want you to understand then is um, what is it that went on with the added boosting algorithm? First of all, do you understand that uh, my raw picture, right, my face picture is the same as my face picture here, right? In Adaboost, I gave it the face picture as some table of numbers, right? Over here, I'm giving it as a vector. In Adaboost, then what did I do with the face picture? When What was my first step with the face picture? What did I do with it? Convolved it with the pattern. With one pattern, with my pattern of experts, whatever my chosen experts are, right? I have first expert, second expert, third expert, and so on, right? So I convolved with that first expert, then I can work with the second expert, can work with the third expert. <clears throat> Those experts are all as though they're like these weights over here, right? They're all weights over here, meaning they're performing the same mathematical calculation for me as I'm doing here, right? I've got my, my input Xs and my Ws are the Adaboost weights, right? I, of, of course, in the Adibus case, I have many, many more in my summation. It's not just two quantities. I have, it's a 50 by 50, so it'll be 2,500 terms, right? 2,500 terms in here added up, right? Then I will also have a threshold in the Adibus world, right? That threshold in the Adibus world is as though I am saying over here, I call it a bias. The bias is basically shifting my threshold for whatever, whenever my Z goes through this nonlinear thing over here, it's going to have something come out over here. And I'm either going to be happy with it or I'm going to be unhappy with it, right? Well, that threshold is going to help me fix it better. So that B is like my Adaboost threshold, okay? Now, um, in the Adaboost world, how did I pick my pattern? How did I pick my winning pattern each time? How did I pick my winning expert each time in the Adaboost world? You pick, pick the best weak, ex, weak expert that complemented the other experts? Right. So whatever the moment was, wh whatever time I was picking that expert, I wanted the one that did the best amongst all the experts, right? The best amongst all the experts, not at the very first stage, but that new stage where the difficult examples have gotten so difficult to solve that I will find the one that cracks the difficult examples, right? But whatever it is, I'm picking them from a menu of choices of experts. It's a menu of choices. It's a banquet. It's a buffet, right? The algorithm is producing for me all the experts laid out one by one and saying this expert would have generated this error for you, this expert would have generated this error for you. Is them all on. I'm just going to pick the best one, right? Okay. So in Adaboost approach, I'm enumerating all of my possible weights. I'm enumerating all of my sets of possible weights. And I'm choosing the best team that makes the most sense. Okay. In this neural networks approach, I'm not doing that. In neural networks approach, I'm starting with a nonsensical set of weights that don't make any sense, that give me a wrong answer. But then I have this ability to iteratively correct myself again and again and again. I'll keep correcting and correcting and correcting until my weights are the perfect ones that I want them to be. So do you see the basic two approaches between the two different ways of doing it? That's all it is, okay? 
And the big deal is that I can adjust my weights and I can control my nonlinearity here. And in Adiboost, there's also nonlinearity, by the way. In Adiboost, the nonlinearity is the threshold part and the part that I will then add up these experts together, right? To form my two teams and so on, right? And then finally one team will win. That's the nonlinear part in, in, in the Adaboost approach. Uh, in this approach, I introduce my nonlinearity by this function over here, by this function over here, I make it nonlinear. And so what they found is that if you stack up sets of these ones, do one first, then do another one, then do another one, then do another one in a sequence. I introduced so much nonlinearity that I've introduced enough nonlinearity as my problem needed. Okay, so now I'm able to solve problems like show me any angle of Niels Lobo's face, and the algorithm is going to be able to tell me that it's Niels Lobo versus one of you guys. Okay, so that's the basic idea in neural networks, okay? Um, I'll spend a little bit more time going through this today, and then I'll come back in the afternoon, uh, this afternoon and spend more time on it in much greater detail. Uh, and then I will uh, come back, I believe tomorrow and deal with how we work with actual images now and not just simple vectors as I'm showing you here. Okay, so here I'm just showing you strung up simple simple vectors, right? And indeed, the example being used for the rest of today is not at all faces, but it is um, the case of it's the case of. Um, working with two numbers and and the idea is to uh, take my two numbers, so my number x1 and x2, whatever they are, and if the gap between the numbers is even, if it's an even difference between them, then I want to output a zero at the final end of the network over here. I want to output a zero. And if the gap between them is odd, I want to output a one, okay? So we're going to look at that training example. Uh, moving forward, I'll just quickly do a little bit more of this and then we'll get back to, uh, we'll take a lunch break for an hour and so on. So let me just- uh, hey, Professor, I got some quick questions. Yeah, yes, go ahead and ask please. Um, so this is something I've I've noticed myself and, and I'm not sure if there's a relationship here that exists but since you're really good at stuff i thought i'd ask you um the way that the uh, neural networks are trained is that a kind of a version of non-linear least squares because I, i've noticed that there's a lot of similarities between the two uh I mean, nonlinear least squares is trying to fit a function, right? Yeah. Okay, so the neural network is also trying to fit a function. Yeah. And in that sense, there's similarity, but very often the neural network will be not nonlinear least squares, because nonlinear least squares is very specific. It's, yeah. saying, it's saying the difference between your actual data points and the difference between what the model has in mind. Take those differences, square them, and then you find the least of the squares, right? That, that set of squares that gives you the least error, right? Yeah. In neural networks, you have different choices for how to measure that error at the end. Okay. The particular error that we are doing here might look like least squares, but that's one version of what is called a loss function. There are many, many types of loss functions people use instead. Okay. Okay. Um, and then another question. Um, like, I understand that the weights have to be updated individually. But how do you know one particular weight needs to be updated? That's something that's confused me. No, no, you don't do it as need to. Uh, oh, well, yeah, the, the, the back propagation, uh, the, the partial derivatives will tell you 
you have to update all the weights, okay? Yeah. The partial derivative formulas that I'm going to do later on this afternoon will tell us how to update each weight. Oh, okay, cool. Okay. Meaning that partial derivative will tell us what the pathway was for that weight to get to the final answer. And that pathway will determine how the update has to take place. So, okay, so, in, so we'll be dealing with that in detail later. Yeah, go on. Next question. Uh, so in some iteration, the weight might not change. The weight for like some fact for some value might converge. Uh, not only might converge, it may be that uh, it doesn't have much to do with the error or something like that. So it's weight changing its weight doesn't make a difference, right? The system figures out that it doesn't make a difference, and so it won't change that weight. Okay. That's possible. But generally speaking, things are not that strange. I mean, that's a strange case, okay? Generally speaking, all the weights are changing, all the weights are updating together. But there are cases, and they'll talk, up, there's all sorts of fancy neural networks that go on and all those things. But for today, we're just dealing with the very, very simple cases here, just so you understand the basic ideas, right? Okay. So do we have any further questions before I proceed with some more detail? No, okay. So uh, in this neural network, then, uh, what we're dealing with today, uh, we're going to have these pale blue units, which are the input units. That's the numbers that I'm going to provide as my inputs. Then I have these hidden universe, these, these hidden units. These are like the brown yellow colors over here. And they are what is called fully connected, fully connected because uh, each unit is fully connected to the previous layer. The previous layer is this blue layer. I only had two units in the previous layer. So as long as each unit gets inputs from the previous both layer, both units, that means it's fully connected, right? Okay. And then this one is also, this purple one is also fully connected because it's getting inputs from all of the previous layer, which was these three brown layers here, right? Okay, these three brown units here, right? Okay. So the brown units are called the, the hidden layer because they're hidden, meaning uh, the user doesn't interact with them. The user interacts with these two over here by providing the input, and the user interacts with this last one over here by checking the output to see if it's correct or not, and sending back a training signal, right? But the rest are hidden from the user. The user never touches them at all, okay? Now, the algorithm will touch them, but not the user. Okay, so uh, here are the weights and all that, and then the main idea you need to understand is that the weights are the ones doing all the learning, right? Because the weights are gonna be adjusted to be just correct so that I will get for this input here, I will get the output that I want. The weights are gonna be continuously adjusted, continuously adjusted until all of my examples are satisfied, right? Correctly, okay? So that's the story there. So the weights are doing the learning. So here we wanna deal with this problem of the odd and even situation, okay? So then, Uh, in this particular problem case, we are going to assume that there's a bias sitting down over here, a B1. And for this calculation, there's a bias B2 sitting down here. We're going to assume that. And we're going to assume that the values of B1 and B2 are uh, 0.1 and 0.2. Okay. So now initially we started with, as I said, totally nonsensical weights, randomly generated useless weights that have nothing to do with the reality. But we started with whatever we get. So in this particular case, the random weights were 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.1, 0 0.8, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and 0 0.9, okay? These are the random weights that were given to this process, right? By some random or randomly generated algorithm. Okay, so now we're gonna calculate the first Z value that we want for this unit here. So this unit is gonna get its input from this input unit and from this input unit. So that means we're gonna take the two times the 0.2 and we're gonna take the nine times the 0.8 and we're gonna add them up. And then we have to add the bias term down here, which is the 0.1, okay? So this is the total calculation down here. Okay, this, this is the total calculation down here. We do it, the answer is 7.7. .7. That 7.7 .7 we feed in through this formula over here and we end up getting 0.9995, okay? So now we know the final answer for that unit there. We go ahead and we similarly do the calculation for the next unit, which is for this one. We similarly look at 
its inputs were 2 times 0 0.6 and 9 times 0 0.3 plus the bias term was still 0 0.1. So we add it all up, do it all. We get some number. We feed that number in through the nonlinear calculation. That number, by the way, was uh, 4. We feed the 4 <coughs> through the nonlinear calculation, and we get 0 0.980, right? Then we do it for the third unit over here. We take the two times the 0 0.1 and the nine times the 0 0.6, uh, then times the 0 0.7 and the bias term at the bottom. We put all of that together in this calculation here and we end up getting 6.6. .6. That 6.6 .6 we feed in through the sigma, through this, through that e one of a, one plus e to the whatever e to the minus and so on we feed in that and we get the answer 0.9986 <coughs> which is this answer down here okay now we're still doing what is called the forward pass so the forward pass just continues values going through the network until the very end over here on the right so now we're ready to do this final step over here where we will take this quantity times this weight and this quantity times this weight, and this quantity times this weight, we'll add them up and we'll feed them through its sigmoid function <laughs> and we'll get some answer back. And that answer for us will be, once you do it very, very, very carefully, remember the bias here term was different. The bias term here was 0.2. So it's a point two down here. <coughs> and now we feed it through the sigmoid. And our final answer is 0.8796. Okay. But we, because it was a two minus nine situation, two minus nine is seven. That's odd. So we wanted our answer in the odd cases to be a one, right? So now we have a gap between what we wanted and what we got. That gap, we're gonna take that and we're gonna come back. Uh, I'll take a break right now, I think. And we'll come back from lunch <clears throat> and we'll do the whole business of how you update the weights based on that gap, okay? So uh, let's take a little bit over one hour for lunch, not a full uh, till two o'clock uh, Eastern time. Uh, right now I have it as uh, 12, uh, 12.45 Eastern time, so we would have, Exactly one hour would be 145. We can come back at 10 till or five till or something like that. So we'll take about 65 minutes of lunch break, okay? And we come back and we proceed from there. Okay, so you all good? So uh, if you have any questions, you can email me or something or you can postpone them till after lunch, okay? Thank you. We hope you all have a lunch that you can enjoy. Hey, by the way, I found out some possibly good news for you guys. Uh, the lady tells me that <clears throat> the payments are gonna come in she said for eight of you, the payments are coming in uh, in the next five days uh, in your bank accounts. And for two of you, for whatever reasons, you were a little bit slow in getting the paperwork or something to, to her. So she said the payments are gonna come in like another few days later, okay? But it's all better than I thought. I thought it was gonna be June 5 or something, but it looks like it's gonna be more like May 25, okay? So hopefully the payments come in soon. Do let us know when you start seeing payments in your bank account, okay? Take care, I'll talk to you after lunch, bye. Enjoy your lunch, bye. So as far as I know, we're coming back to the same spot, okay, to the same Zoom link. So we'll all come back. I believe I'm the host right now. So I'll probably just stay on. Uh, you guys feel free to go away and do whatever. You can leave and join me again later on. Okay, I mean, you don't have to be, or you can just turn it in frozen and come back. Okay, bye. Bye, everyone, bye.
professor? Yes. I have sort of like a weird question. Uh, is there yes. like a, is there like an algorithm to differentiate between identical twins? I uh, think if they're identical, it will be very hard. I, I don't believe there's an algorithm to do that. I don't believe. I mean, I could be surprised, but if they're identical, it would be very hard. I believe. Because it may be that um, one twin looks like the other at different ages and all that, you know. Now, if you're talking about studying complete mannerisms and activities and all, then, then there probably is a way to tell. Because maybe the way they walk is a little bit different, the way they shake the, you know, the gait and all that sort of stuff. Maybe one is a little bit taller than the other, even though identical twins, I don't know if there's a normal body size difference. I don't know about that, but um, anyway, who knows? So why did you ask that question? Do you Just have curious. Okay. So, uh, Dr. Lobo, quick question for you. Can you ditch us? Oh, here he is. Okay, so we'll probably begin in about a minute from now. So, um, let us see where people are at. So, uh, Dr. Lobo. Yes, go ahead. Um, you said you're interested in memory, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, as, not necessarily as a research topic, but certainly as a personal interest, yeah. Oh, okay. The reason I bring it up is recently, and I kind of decided, okay, in sort of like a nostalgic trip, I decided I'm going to boot up one of my like really old smart devices and listen to some of the music on there. Mm -hmm. And that was back when I was really into like Minecraft and whatnot. Yeah. And I kid you not, I heard like the first 10 seconds of the first track on there. And I was just sitting on my couch looking around and I could look at something and like flash back to it. It was so weird. Huh. I, like I would flash back because like before then, the only like really thing that would cause me to flash back was like this one brand of commercial soap that was at my elementary school. Uh -huh. And like I would smell that and that would like tie me back to that. But listening to these songs brought me way more memories than that ever did. Oh, I think uh, that that's that's not a surprising thing. I think I think people know that sound in music is a lot of. Uh, that's why people love music so much because it takes them back. It reminds them of happier days and so on. Yeah. So uh, so there is a connection. There's definitely a strong connection between music and and audio and and people's memories. I, I don't know exactly yeah. what it is, but there's yeah. I mean that's. That's why music is so popular with people because they love it. Yeah. But just that I'd bring that up because it was like kind of recent. I was like, whoa. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, this yeah, strong, yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot to look at about those connections. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I don't know who will be the person to study that. But, yeah. 
good. Um, so uh, who, who are we waiting for? I think, uh, how many of us are here? Nine participants, so we're missing a couple of people, right? Okay, there were actually, actually Robert and I are here, so that's two taken. Uh, just give me one second, okay? There's someone at my door, hang on one sec, please. Okay, so we're all here now. Is everybody here and everybody to, to be here? So let me count one, two, three. Everyone's here. Seven, okay, very good. So then let's jump right in and uh, continue with where we were. So we were talking about uh, basic neural networks. And uh, so first of all, let me share my screen. I guess that's what I need to do, right? So let me pull up my screen sharing then, share screen. Okay, so can you more or less all begin to see something on my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, so uh, let's recap the basic ideas. The basic ideas is that, so first of all, uh, are you all familiar with writing this, uh, uh, the weighted sum as a vector? times another vector, but the first vector you have to transpose it. Are you all familiar with that notation and why one has to do that? Like this WTX, you all know what that means. Uh, if you don't know what that means, just- no. Yeah, not exactly. Okay, no. See, uh, so basically it's all about dot products in algebra, right? In matrix algebra, dot products. Dot products are the same as a one location convolution, uh, which is that you, you take your string of two strings of numbers, two strings of numbers, and then you multiply each first one by the first one, then the second one by the second one, third one by the third one, and then you add them all up, right? So that's that's the same as the one location convolution that we did today, okay? Now, that is also known in algebra as a dot product or a scalar product between two vectors, okay? Professor? If you take a matrix algebra class, that's what they'll teach you up front, right at the beginning, okay? Professor? Yes, go ahead. Uh, do we assume that the regular W is a column vector and that W transpose is a row vector? No, that's the whole point, that um, you assume the X's, each vector being given to you is a vertical thing. You assume that, 
And so to make it a horizontal thing, you put the transpose on top of it. Okay, yeah, yeah, that's what I meant. Okay, that's all it is, okay? And so that way you can do the multiplication between W and X then. Otherwise, if, if you just wrote down W, X, then they're both vertical and the math doesn't allow you to multiply them, right? Okay, so do people now have a better understanding of what the T is doing in there between W and X? It's just forcing one to be horizontal so that the matrix multiplication can be carried out properly, okay? Yes, are you guys generally somewhat familiar with? So I guess like the transposition of a vector is like if it's all like one column, it makes it horizontal and vice versa? Yes. Okay, Correct. cool. Correct, that's all the transposition does. It, it converts rows into columns and columns into rows. So it basically flattens one out and makes one more vertical and so on as needed. Okay, that's all the transposition does, okay? Um, and I guess maybe you guys haven't done enough matrix algebra and I should have spent some time doing that, but I don't think I have time today for that. Maybe some other day, I'll spend a little bit of time doing some basic matrix algebra so that in case you run into it, any papers that you're reading and so on, you a little bit more familiar then, okay? But let me uh, just tell you then, so right now, the key idea is that your input is coming in as, a, as X, right? As the vector X. And right now we're just talking about it as X1 and X2. There's only two quantities, but it could be more. And then the weights are their own vector with W1, W2 and so on. And then here it's showing the B as a separate quantity to the addition, right? But I was telling you, you can also think of the B itself as part of the input. And then, then it would need the weight of a one on it, okay? Did you all get that concept earlier? Yes? That if I, if I multiply the B by a one, then that's the same as treating my input vector as X and B together. And then my weights are whatever weights I had plus the one tagged on at the bottom, right? Okay. So that gives me my linear answer Z. Then I take my linear answer and I plug it into a nonlinear step. And that gives me the final answer output from the neuron. And that's all I care about, okay? That I got some nonlinear answer based on this, but my inputs are still being multiplied by weights that are gonna be linear, right? Okay, so that's the critical idea here. Now, for the nonlinear step, there are a variety of different things they can use. Um, so what you're seeing is the sigma, sigma function in, in, the, uh, in the language of neural networks, it's called the sigmoid function, sigmoid function. So it basically, the shape of it looks like this, okay? What that means is that uh, if the value Z that you calculated from the previous linear step is highly negative, then it's gonna be, uh, all the way up to a certain point close to the zero value, it's gonna be treated as zero, right? Then it rises in almost a linear fashion. And then as soon as it gets past the zero value in a symmetric manner, it gets close to one. And then it, no matter how high it is, it'll be one, okay? It could be plus infinity. The answer is still only gonna be one. It's not gonna go the, the fun. It, see, if the input was plus infinity, then a linear, function would have kept the output also plus infinity. You understand that point? That's what linear would, the linear is the line slope equals one, right? Slope equals one line is the perfect linear function, right? So this is nonlinear because it has this curve in here and this curve in here, but it has the curves in just the right places to force some behavior that we want, which is that we want uh, things that are very negative to be treated as zero and things that are extremely positive to be just treated as one. And then in between, we're gonna ramp up accordingly in a linear manner, okay? Now the tan H function is similar to the sigmoid function in the shape, but it has, it goes from minus one to plus one, okay? But slightly similar behavior. And then uh, there's this thing called the, uh, the rectified linear unit. So it would have been linear if it all looked like this slopey line over here. It would have been just simple linear. That would be slope equals one, right? The slope equals one line is the perfect linear function, okay? But rectified linear means you're changing it. You're fixing it from its linearness. You're not keeping it totally linear. You're making it nonlinear at the negative quantities. So the negative quantities will be zero. When it comes in with a negative quantity, it'll be zero, but only when it's positive, it'll be linear, okay? So again, together, togetherly, it acts nonlinearly. And actually, surprisingly, it's very popular. I don't really understand why it's more popular than the sigmoid, but it is. And uh, people use the rectified linear unit a lot, a tremendous amount, all over the place, okay? Uh, then of course, the leaky 
rectified linear unit means you're not completely zero, you're, you're, you're a little bit negative value, okay? And so on, okay? So you can invent any nonlinear function that you want and put it in here as long as it seems to work and is appropriate and so on. And those are the set of activation functions. Now, the popular two, as I said, are going to be the sigmoid and the ReLU, the rectified linear unit, okay? Sure. Yes, go ahead, Zane. Uh, can, uh, can I think of the sigmoid as a, like a rescaling of the input features? The rescaling of the previous step, which is a nonlinear, which is the linear output. Um, well, but it's not really rescaling because rescaling would have been uh, a constant amount of scaling, right? Yeah. So then the original shape would have been preserved, but this one destroys the original shape. Okay. okay. It takes it and it makes it definitely only values between zero and one. So huge values are made to one and huge negative values are made to zero. And so okay, on. I see. Okay. Uh, Professor, I have a question too. Yeah, go ahead. Um, so from from my <clears throat> my observations of actually testing some of these from class, um, I noticed that there is like a, a certain amount if you use it so many times throughout like the hidden layers, there, there seems to be like a loss of information at some point where you have so many, is that, cause like if, if the, the um, rel U has like, um, inf like there's numbers that are positive, but then some are negative and that becomes zero, like that information is kind of lost in a way. And, and like, is that like, I, I feel like some of these may be more beneficial than others um, in, in a well, way see, like keep, that. See, keep in mind, keep in mind that that rectification of when you're deciding to cut it off and so on, you do understand that that had something to do with the bias, right? Because the bias shifted that function to where you want to consider it as zero and where you don't want to consider it as zero. Do you see that point? Yeah, and and just a, a kind of a experimenting on my own, um, I I did one with a whole bunch of of uh, layers, hidden layers. Would you only and, use ReLUs or not? Yeah, and I was only using ReLUs. Okay, and, uh, and I, then did I you found... include biases? No, I didn't include biases. Okay, because see, the bias is what allows it not to be stupid, right? Okay. If you don't use the bias, then it's stupid and it's doing the same thing for every one of them. And you're right, all negative things are lost and all positive things are kept when they're all linear. So what's the point? Okay. But if you start allowing that shift in the bias, then that bias is shifting who's considered negative and who's considered positive. The bias is, when do you start considering something positive? When do you start considering something negative? That's what the bias does for you. Okay. okay the bias cool. is like a threshold that says, when are you accepting it and when are you not accepting it, right? That, okay. So think about that yeah. way, okay? If you want to go and try those experiments again, I'd be curious to know what happened. Yeah. Okay, cool. but Thanks. that's the story with that, okay? So there's multiple choices. And again, um, I have to confess, I'm not an expert at this stuff. I don't know when to use which one. I would just play around in trial and error, use one, the one that works better for the problem. Um, in the literature, I think some people are experts at these, but I don't even believe that they anybody is the complete God expert on this topic, okay? And that's partly because I think there are a huge number of uh, different activation functions you can also use, okay? So that's the story on that. Uh, so then uh, we're talking about the input layer, the hidden layer, and the output layer. You've seen all of those slides already. Now we're going on to uh, looking at the fact that the weights do the learning. Uh, in this case, you're picking specific examples now. Uh, you've got the uh, problem where you're saying the difference between the two numbers is it odd or even. And if it is odd, you want it to be a one output as a final output. If it's zero, if it's even, you want it to be a zero output and so on, okay? So then we show you how to do the forward calculations. We did that earlier uh, before lunch. And now we want to figure out how to change the weights, right? That's the whole idea, okay? So this brings us to the slide here, calculating the error. So we said that we have, uh, uh, the output is not what we wanted it to be. So now we're going to introduce something called the loss function. The loss function is going to, to take that gap that you have between the correct answer and the desired answer and do something with it. It's either going to, treat it as a distance formula or as a squaring of the quantity or some other nonlinear transformation of the quantity, whatever it is, it's called a loss function and it's just gonna 
it, and the loss functions are very can get very very elaborate and very very complicated. Uh, meaning, sometimes you'll see later on that the loss has to do with how you want to control the experiment. Do you want the experiment to focus on a certain kind of something? Then you have a certain loss term, and maybe your final loss function is a summation of many loss terms, each term contributing some factor in the problem. Okay. And so again, I don't want to spend too much time on that because there's nothing I can say that would be smart about it right now. Okay, better for you just to see it as you run into different problems and so on, right? For now, the loss function that we're going to use is the simple, uh, uh, the uh, mean square error loss. And so that's going to be the one where we're simply going to, uh, you know, take the, the quantity of the loss and we are going to, uh, so the target is the quantity we wanted, the output is the quantity that we got. We're gonna take the difference between them, we're gonna square it and gonna divide it by half, okay? Now it turns out that this reason for dividing by half is very cleverly chosen because later on in a few minutes, you're gonna see that we need to take derivatives of all these terms in order to figure out how to change the weights. We need to take derivatives of everything. So it turns out the derivative becomes easy when you take the derivative of this. This two here comes and sits on the front that cancels out with the half and you get some fairly simple term here. So choosing these loss functions is also kind of smart sometimes, choosing them just correctly so that things become easier for you to do the calculations moving forward, right? Okay, but for now, let's not assume that we were smart about it. Just assume somebody gave us this error function, right? The square, squared error function, loss function. They gave us this and they said, so your total error at the end is to be the gap between the target and the output. You square it and you half it. And uh, the summation is for how many output units you have, okay? So it turns out in our problems case, we only had one output unit, right? We only had one purple unit, not three or four of them. See, we only have one output unit here, right? So because one output unit, the summation goes away and there's only one thing to add up in the sum, okay? But if you had had more and you're allowed to have more uh, and different problems require you to have more and so on, then you would have a summation of the error from each of those units would be added up and that would be your total error, okay? Now, so in our case then, when we do the calculation, we find that our total error then is this quantity here, right? Okay, now back propagation means we want to take that amount of error and we want to figure out what percentage of it came from which weight, okay? Because what we had was a network of weights. We have a network of weights here, here which is weight one, weight two, weight three, weight four, and so on, all these different weights, right? Weight seven, weight nine, weight 10, and so on, whatever. One, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine weights in this problem, right? Uh, so we want to know how each one of those weights contributed to this quantity of error, what the percentage of it contributes to the error, okay? And the way you do that is you take the uh, derivative of the, uh, the error term with respect to the weight. Okay, so you set up a equation that says, you set up an equation that says, I want to take the partial of the complete error, right? With respect to the particular weight that I'm looking to change. So it's W7 or it's W5 or it's W2 or whatever it is, right? I simply write it out that way to start, okay? Now, once you do that, once you decide which weight you're trying to change at that moment, then it turns out, um, the way that you actually look for finding the equation in order to do the update is you isolate a pathway to the network. Okay, so you isolated this pathway here, this purple drawn pathway here. And in that pathway, we find that we've got X1 is the input over here, right? X1 is the input. It's going through a weight W1, okay? It's ending up in a calculation caused Z, called Z1. Now Z1 didn't only get inputs from X1 and W1, it also got inputs from W2 and X2, right? But whatever it is, Z1 
is calculated at some point in that pathway. Then Z1 goes on to nonlinearly get converted into an A1. That's through that, uh, the sigmoid function. gets converted into A1. Then that A1 is the output of this hidden unit over here, right? This hidden unit outputs this 0.9995. So that comes out as A1 over here, okay? Now that A1 then goes to the second stage of the network. And that is that means the A1 then is multiplied by the W7. And then other things are multiplied down here outside of the blue pathway. And they go on to contribute to the Z, to the Z calculation here. Okay. And then that Z calculation goes through its nonlinear, uh, same sigmoid step like we did before. And we get the final A out. And that is our output from the system. So, Again, this is just showing you the same pathway uh, with actual number examples worked in here, right? The actual numbers are put in here. So you, you can follow so that you really understand the pathway carefully that way, okay? Now, the thing is, that is the final output. Now we wanna use that output formula that we had for the error. We said error was this, right? This thing here, summation of half times the square of the gap and so on. Okay, add all those guys up. So that is what we want to talk about as a partial E, right? But our first challenge was, we said we wanted to figure out how to update weight seven, right? So the first thing you do is you write down partial of E with respect to seven, okay? So you're asking, how does the total error change if we set our variable that we're interested in knowing about is W7. So how does that total error change based on W7? Okay, so now you have to come down to this part of the figure over here, which is, I've just taken this, this part of the figure and I've blown it up here, right? And you realize that the E was written as this, right, as a summation. Of course, the summation didn't matter because it's really just one quantity. It's half of target minus output squared, right? So that's our expression for E, okay? So what we get is an E that depends on this value output, right? E depends on output. So output is like a variable for us at that step. Then what was output? Output was the same as A because that's what we said A was. A was becoming our output over here, okay? So please don't get lost. This is an easy step to get lost at. Please definitely understand that A and out and output are the same thing, right? Yes, A and out and output are the same thing, okay? Yes, make sure that you make a note of that for yourself so you don't get confused either now or later on, right? A and out and output are the same thing, okay? Okay, so now you have a dependence of E on output and therefore E depends on A because A and output are the same thing, right? So you found out that you have a dependence of E based on A. Well, it turns out A came from Z, right? There was a Z calculated here before this, before this vertical line. The vertical line signifies the move into the nonlinear part, right? So before we did the nonlinear part, we had a Z. That nonlinear part was the calculation that gave us A. That means A depends on Z. So what we found so far is that E depends on output, which depends on, which is the same as A. So E depends on A. We just found that A depends on Z. And now we also happen to know that Z was calculated by the formula that summed everything up over here at this step, it summed everything up, including the W7 quantity. Therefore, Z depends on W7, right? So we have three dependencies, okay? We found out that E depends on out or A or output is the same thing. Then we found out that out and A, because they're the same thing, they, they depend on Z. That was the second red arrow that we showed there. And the last red arrow to the left is this one that says, how does Z depend on W7? Okay, 
So you see how you've got three dependency terms here when you use the chain rule to expand this partial derivative thing here. You get three dependency terms, and those three dependency terms can be visualized by these three red arrows. Okay, so for those of you that are seeing this for the very first time, I'm sure this is all like, you're wondering what land you're in, right? This is like La La Land or so. But if you spend enough time working it through and thinking about what it means, okay, the picture is showing you how one variable depends on the other, okay? That's what the picture is showing you with the red arrows. This chain rule expression here is using the picture to write down what the dependencies are. Okay, because at the end of it, you want to have this chain rule written out. That's the goal. Once you have the chain rule written out carefully like this, then you can go and you can figure out what is this quantity. You can go and figure out what is this quantity. You can go and figure out what is this quantity. Go and figure out each of these three quantities. You can multiply them out and you get the final dependence on uh, what the error depended on that, on that particular weight, right? Once you know that, that's called the gradient quantity. Once you know that, you multiply that gradient quantity by the learning rate. A learning rate is something that you pick. Uh, a learning rate is typically picked to be small because you don't wanna learn things too fast from, a, from the first few examples, right? Because you're gonna be running many, many, many examples in this thing, not just one or two examples. You're gonna run million, you know, thousands of examples, right? Like if it's the uh, even odd problem, the gap of numbers being even, the gap of numbers being odd, then where would you get your examples from? Can you tell me? Can, can you ask that question again? I, I got a little confused. Okay. I said in the even odd problem, so not the face detection problem or anything, right? In the problem where we're trying to figure out whether the gap between two numbers is even or the gap between two numbers is odd, and we want the network to output a one or a zero accordingly, right? In that problem, where would you get your training examples from? You could randomly generate it and then manually count, or not man, uh, have the computer calculate the difference and determine whether it's even or odd. Correct. But, but how many examples would you have, do you think? I'd say you could, since it's so easy to generate this type of data, you could keep generating them on the fly until you get an accuracy that you like. Okay, but the point is thousands, right? Okay, hundreds and thousands, right? Many, many, many examples, okay? More likely be that much, yes. Mm -hmm. Because the problem is, see, you, you first will run your algorithm on your training data. So you decide your training data first. So you decide many pairs of numbers. Then you figure out whether they are odd or even quietly, right? So that the God knows the god of the algorithm knows whether they're odd or even. Then you run them through the system and you see if the system generates the numbers that you want, the odd or even numbers that you want, right? That, that one or zero that you want. Then you go back and you train, train, train a million times. Then what would you do after it was all trained up? All trained up, first of all, what does all trained up mean? What does that actually mean in this game? What was that again? That it converts. No, no, but what does it mean to converge? What what behavior do you see from it that makes you happy to know you can stop training? What is that? It has a high accuracy. Okay, but what does that mean in practice? These are all vague words you guys are using. I want you to be concrete and tell me real things. It fully understands the training data. Again, that's too vague. Be oh. specific. Well, you want it to say that it's odd when it's odd, even when it's even. Correct. And you want it to be exactly close to a one or a zero, right? Yeah. You want it to be 0 0.9999 when it was odd, and you want it to be 0 0.00001 when it's even, right? It'll never be really perfect. It'll get very close, but never be really perfect. Okay. So you want it to be that way, right? But what does that mean for it to be that way? What does it mean when you decide, okay, I now know it's trained up, I can stop. What did you just do to verify that? You have to test it. 
You have to test it on what? On a test set. Okay, very good. So we're getting closer to the right answer here, right? So we'll have a test set, which we would not have trained up on, right? First of all, you got to do correct on the training set, okay? That's the first step, right? You got to do well on the training set. Otherwise you won't stop training, right? You'll continue training until you get correct on the training set. Then you have a second set called a validation set. It's not really test set because test applies to the real world later on. Now, I don't know why anybody would want to know what the differences between two numbers are, whether it's already, I don't know whether that's a real problem or not, but supposing it was, right? Supposing it was a problem that uh, based on that, you're going to award, uh, you know, you know, lottery winnings or something like that. So people are going to give you random pairs of numbers and based on whether they're odd or even, you're going to, to, to give them some money or something. So you better be correct. You better be sure that you're giving the right person the money. That means whatever numbers they come up with, you better correctly assess whether they're even or odd and give them the money or not or whatever you have to do, right? But the point is you cannot predict what numbers they're going to come up with, right? Do you see that point? So the fact that you cannot predict their numbers, that's a real testing situation. When you cannot predict the true inputs coming in, that's real test. When you're making up a fake testing set to test the system, when you're making them up yourself to test and see if it's good enough, that's called a validation set, okay? So my point is you will have chosen, first of all, a large number of training examples and then a large number of validation set examples. And when your system is functioning well on both of those, you'll quit and say, okay, we're ready now for the real test in the real world, okay? So that was the main thing that I want you to be aware of. So because you have large numbers of examples, you don't want it to learn too quickly from a few examples. Because if it learns too quickly for a few examples, maybe it will only get those few examples correct all the time and never be able to generalize to other examples that both it may not have seen in the validation set, before, or if it saw them in the validation set and even there it did well, it may not truly be ready for the real world test when somebody could come up with unpredictable, unpredictable numbers, right? Okay, so my point is that's why you want it to proceed in its learning very, very slowly and let every example teach it a little bit because you know there's gonna be enough time to learn everything you need to learn. Okay, so you're just training a little bit. So that's called the learning rate, okay? So typically the learning rate is set at something like 0.1 or something like that. 0.1 means 10% of the gradient. You're going to use 10% of the gradient towards updating the weight. Okay. Not all of the gradient. If you use all of the gradient, then you're learning a lot from that first step. And then maybe that's not the right way to learn, right? Okay. So that's how you use this quantity once you have it. Once you have this numerical quantity here for this one, then you plug it in here for the gradient. Sorry. You plug it in here for the gradient, multiply by your learning rate, and you change your weight by whatever that quantity is. And that's the new weight, updated weight now, WK plus one. K plus one means that you move from K to the Kth step. <coughs> okay, to the Kth, Kth iteration, right? Okay, so that's all you have to do, right? Is you got to figure out first for each weight, you've got to figure out this kind of chaining, these red arrows, you've got to figure that out. Then you put those red arrows here, you lay them out as quantities. Then you go and you get actual numerical quantities for each one of these quantities. And then you compute your final error, your final gradient. That gradient, you multiply by the learning rate, update your weight and you're done with that step, okay? Then you got to do the next weight and so on, right? Each weight has to be done one by one, okay? So let's look we knew how now to update W7. Now, how would you update W1, okay? So W1, it turns out, has its own chain, okay? So this was the chain to get you to W7. Now let's look at the chain for getting you to W1. This is all W7. All these steps are showing you that. Now, to get to W1, you're using a chain of five steps here. See? So 
this output is what comes out of the system. It's your 0.87 or something, right? You took that 0.87 and you subtracted it from the one, you wanted it to be a one. You subtracted it, you squared it, and you divide it by half, right? You, you divide it by two, right? So that's how you got your E total, okay? So now there's a dependence of E total on out, which is the same as A. Then your dependence of A on Z. Then previously, when we were looking at W7, we simply short-circuited it. We jumped it from Z, depend on W7, and we quit, right? Those were three, three arrows there three red arrows. Now it turns out we're not interested in the dependence of Z on W7. We're interested in the dependence of Z on the output of the previous hidden unit, which was A1. Okay, so that becomes our third red arrow here. Then A1 in turn was the nonlinear processing, the sigmoid processing on Z1. So there's a dependence there. That's the fourth red arrow. And then finally, the fifth red arrow is uh, the Z1 depends on the W1, which is the variable that you want to know about. You want to know how does my final error depend on my W1, okay? You want to know the partial of my final error with respect to W1. And once you have that, once you have that quantity, you go and figure out the real numerical quantity for it. Then you multiply it by the learning rate and you go and you update W1. Okay, are you beginning to see a pattern of how this is done? Uh, I just have a quick question. Go ahead. So when we do the chain rule from E total all the way back to W1, um, is there mathematically a difference between doing just that versus doing every step of the chain? Like so there's no the... there's no way to get to just that numerically without doing the step of the chain. Oh, I see. Right. Meaning you meaning you can say you you can say that's what you want to do. That's what you're saying up here. You're saying you want to do e with respect to w one. You're saying that up here. But there's no numerical way to get that answer without going through all these tiny steps. Each of these five steps. Would it be beneficial to do like dynamic programming? And... Well, there's different games in this whole thing. Yeah. So the good news is that nobody of us has to worry about any of this in practice because this is all set up in these things called uh, uh, these uh, uh, Python based uh, uh, programming environments, right? And they're set up for these deep learning things. They don't even want you to think about it anymore. You just You'll see tomorrow when Robert starts talking to you about how to uh, set up these pieces of programs and so on. You will just specify connections between layers. You'll specify who depends on whom and all that. And you let the software go and figure out all the partial derivatives and the quantities and everything. It will do all the updates. You just give it the training data and so on. So what I'm doing right now is I'm doing a lot of things that a lot of deep learning teachers never teach, right? Because they don't believe you need to know all this stuff. They believe you just need to know how to use the stuff, right? How to use the software and then think about it at that level. But I have a firm belief that if you know mathematically what's going on under the hood, so to speak, then you'll be able to, maybe once in a while, it'll actually be useful to you to solve some problem that you don't know how to solve otherwise, okay? But I'll be honest with you, there's a lot of deep learning teachers professors that don't do any of these details uh, and they jump right into uh, you know the fact that you can update the weights and that you can move on right because you don't need to know how the weights are updated by the system by the software right okay so um, but but basically do you do you see how these red arrows came about and all that do you understand all of that yes okay so we have the red arrows then we want to know how we convert the red arrows into actual co numerical quantities, right? Uh, sorry, now, I, I also had an additional question before. Go ahead. Um, so back when you showed us the equation uh, for the gradient descent algorithm, 
uh, I'm a little bit confused as to what that gradient, like the what we're multiplying the gradient actually is. Is that the derivative that we're calculating? Yes, it's oh, the okay. final part. It's the final partial derivative of because by the way. So again, I take you back to the morning's notion of gradient. Uh, the morning's notion of gradient was we were looking at the intensity function. And asking how does the intensity function vary with its variables, right? And its variables were x and y, right? So we were asking the gradient in that game meant how does the image depend as you move along x, and how does the image depend and vary as you move along y, right? That's what it meant to ask the gradient there. Here you're thinking about this error function as sitting over a multidimensional space where each one of the dimensions is the weight, right? Each one of the dimensions is one of the weights. So if there were only two weights, then it's a two dimensional function, right? Weight one and weight two only, but that's not practical. That's not a real situation, but I'm just telling you to visualize it that way, right? So your error function is sitting on top of the two dimensional W1 and W2 axes, right? But in reality, you have many, many more weights. You have like, in this case, you have nine weights and so on, right? So it's a nine dimensional space and your error function is sitting over that. And what you're asking is the gradient means, how do you move through those nine dimensions all at the same time? How do you take a step in the nine dimensions such that you lower your error function value? So in practice, do you all know what a gradient is like in actual real world? When did you actually ever use a gradient in your life? Outside of Calc 3, I can't really think of a time. <laughs> okay, so so do you all have driver's licenses? Mm -hmm. In in real yeah. life, isn't a gradient just a slope, like going up or down a hill? Aha, uh -huh. very interesting. You didn't say, you did not say a slope of a normal function. You said going up and down a hill. So that's actually the example I wanted you to think about. Now, why did you mention a hill? Can I ask you why? Um, because sometimes if it's particularly steep, they'll put up warning signs that tell you about okay, that's, the that's gradient. Okay, somebody who's, that's somebody who's a trekker, right? You're trekking through the hills. <laughs> but in reality, what I was hoping you would all have said, because you're all efficient and uh, proficient drivers, you would have known on the driving test, there's a question that says, if you're parking on a hill, which way do you turn your front wheels? Do you all it remember that question? Way, yeah, it depends on the way your car is facing. Correct. And the answer is it depends on the gradient of the hill, right? Mm -hmm. So is your hill facing downwards or is your hill facing upwards? Okay, that's what it means, right? So, and then accordingly, you're supposed to turn your wheels a certain way, okay? Right. That is, that is the one place in real life the word gradient actually comes up at the driver's license test, okay? Now, you missed Chu. You said, if you're trekking through the hills, I care about the gradient because sometimes they'll warn you the gradient's too steep, don't try to climb it or whatever, right? That's correct. So all of that is gradient. Gradient is all about looking at hills and where is it too steep? Where should you go around? I mean, that's why when cars go up hills in actual, like on highways and all that, you may have wondered about this. I always wondered about this as a kid. Why do they go around in circles around the mountain, right? They, why don't they go just steep up the mountain? Well, they can't because the gradient's too steep. So you have to circle around the mountain again and again and again. If you're a train, you have to go through tunnels and all that, circling around the mountain until you get to that higher level, then you can keep going straight, right? So that's the idea of gradient. When the gradient's too steep, you must circle around the mountain, right? Like, I. Don't know if, uh, I guess in the West here, they have very nice bicycles that are very efficient and so on. So when you're going up a very steep mountain on a, on a bicycle, you can go at a certain speed, you can change your gear to go up, right? But where I grew up, they only had a one gear bicycle, like, you know, in the third world, one gear bicycle. So what did you do when your gradient was too steep? Do you know what you actually, you actually did when you're going up a road that was too steep? Get off the bike. No, 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 no. That's that. that, uh, that, that, that then that makes the bike the bike not valuable. Uh, you no. pedaled hard. No, 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 not pedaled hard. You go zigzagging across. 
you go zigzagging across the side of the road. Oh, so you're, yeah. you're going in a sinusoidal pattern to the left and right, right? Taking a little bit of gradient at a time, right? It takes you much longer to get up the hill, of course, but it's very convenient. You don't stress yourself out, right? That can work going down the hill too. No, down the hill, you go high speed and then you just worry <laughs> about controlling your brakes. That's all. It's only an uphill problem, right? Okay, so my point is in those areas of life, gradient shows up, right? Okay, whenever it's a hill involved in the story. But the point is that's for a 2D gradient, meaning you're going an X, Y plane and how steep is the hill? In our problems here, the number of dimensions is bigger. It's nine, 10, 20, hundreds of thousands of dimensions. But the error function is still the same way. It's an error function based on all those variables. So ultimately the definition of the gradient is what is the derivative of the error function with respect to each one of those variables, okay? And that's the partial derivative here, right? So that's the story, okay? So once you can compute that, then you can go ahead and update the weight itself that you're using. Got a quick question. Go ahead. Um, so again, with the experimenting with the networks, the neural networks, um, one thing I noticed was that well, what I expected was that the lower I had the uh, the learning rate, I, I just thought that it would learn slower and it wouldn't reach uh, a good rate, a good uh, um, accuracy very fast. But what I noticed was that if I went too small, it would actually get worse. And I, I didn't, that wasn't something I was expecting. It's, and I don't understand that. I cannot say that I have a good intuitive answer for that either. Uh, so, so I don't know the answer to that. It, it may have something to do with the, that is so small that, that the error in the calculation, I mean, remember in multiple calculations of hundreds of calculations, there's some round off error going on, right? Round off error means you're losing, you're truncating your numbers and so on. So you're losing some, uh, some accuracy from just the fact that the calculation is happening on a computer, right? So maybe your learning rate is so small compared to that round of error that you're missing, you're, you're losing where you need to go, right? Like somebody told you go in that direction and you're not even able to take a step in that direction because you went too small in that direction. You fell into the pit between what course created by the round of error. That could be what's happening. I don't know the answer to the question. I'm yeah, sorry. That, that makes total sense, but it actually brings up another question. Um, I've heard that some learning uh, methods will add the log of the, the um, weights when they multiply, instead of multiplying, they're adding the log um, because you can ha have less round off error when you do that. That could um, be, and that's a machine specific thing, meaning meaning only an engineer would want to think about that, right? A mathematician would never care about that, right? Yeah. Okay. But, but you're correct. An engineer who has to deal with a real machine would care about how to, yeah, that may be true. Again, you know, I don't do that much of the real computation, so I don't deal with the logging things. But I agree with you, it makes perfect sense to do it that way. And, and if that's what you need to do, then again, hopefully the team that you're working with in the summer will have lots of other ideas as well to do those calculations correctly, right? Okay. So you're raising very good questions, uh, but let's also move along because I wanna get through the basic ideas, right? Um, so at this point, those of you that are not asking questions, so let me see, I have seen questions from if I look at my whole group of you here, so I'm, 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 I'm putting you all up on my screen here. So I know who all is here. Um, okay, so um, I have seen questions from Michael Brown. I've seen questions from Zane. I've seen questions from Ethan. Uh, I think Chu has asked me a couple of questions. Brian, you've been mostly quiet, but it would be nice if you can ask one or two questions just to be part of the questioning crowd, right? Sanjay, I think you've asked me a couple already, right? Robert, you need to increase your question quotient for the day, okay? QQ is your question quotient, okay? And Tess and Leah, you as well, think about it. And Lee Meow as well, if you can just think about asking some question, right? I mean, engage enough with it and ask some questions, right? So that I know that you're kind of following along, you're trying to think about it. And if you're lost also, that's okay. You can always say, 
you know, this is the part that I wish I knew more about. Can you explain it again? And maybe somebody else was also thinking that question, but it was just not bold enough to ask, right? Okay. But the bottom line is, um, that's where we are now. We are looking at uh, how to generate these chain of partial derivatives. And that's done by the chain rule, but it's also done pictorially by the way that I just showed you. But believe it or not, you will never need to worry about it uh, in your experiments because it's all done but for you by the software, okay? So the software will know what depends on what and all that and will set up the partial derivatives for you. All you will do is set up the overall task, provide the training examples, you tell it what the loss function is and so on, what nonlinear activation function you wanna use. You'll tell it the sizes of things, you'll tell it how much convolution window size you want, all those kinds of things. And then just let the whole thing rip and run. How many, how many examples you're gonna use and all that, okay? So, but I still want you to understand these things because I do believe there's a lot of value in understanding them, right? Okay. So um, back to the slides then. Uh, so we understood that um, we knew that with respect to W1, we had these three partials over here, okay? Oh, oh, no, sorry, W1, that's just the beginning of it. In the end, you have five of them, okay? In the end, you have a chain of five. In the end, you have a chain of five of these with respect to W1, right? Okay, and that chain is shown over here. And you had the chain for W7 was these three quantities, right? Okay, so W7 was the smaller chain. It went from E to out, which is the same as A, then it went from A to Z, and then it simply went from Z to W7, right? So that was the chain over here, E to out, out to Z, and Z to seven, okay? Now, so now that you have these two lists of chain rule, so now that you have these two lists of the chain rule for the two, the two weights. Now you want to go ahead and actually do the update, right? So you have to compute each of the partials, okay? So if you look at the, uh, did they already do the one from W7? I think they already did it earlier. So let me go back there. Yeah, so the one for W7, uh, it depends on three partials, okay? And here is how you calculate the actual partials. So, I have to go back one, one higher. Okay, so let me see. So the very first part of the partial is this part of the chain here, the D dependence of E on out, right? This very first, this most rightmost red arrow, right? That's the very first partial. So you go and you work it out, right? You find out that the partial of the whole expression, right? The partial of the function with respect to out, right? So you write it this way and you realize that your variables and all that, out is the variable. So you go ahead and you do your calculus rule for taking the derivative of something. You bring the, you keep the constant out. You pull this half out to the out, to, to, to the left. You have to take the power two. So you bring the two down here. And then of course it's two minus one and so on. Times, in this case, the chain rule says, uh, you have to take the derivative of what the inside quantity is, right? Well, the derivative is a negative quantity inside. So that gives you minus one here, okay? So your complete derivative then is simply, once you simplify everything, is simply this, it's minus target minus out, okay? Or you could think of, you could, you could just negate it and it would be out minus target, right? Okay, so now you go and you plug in your actual quantities, right? So your target was one, your out was minus 8.7 and so on. You calculate it out and that is your 
answer to the first partial that you need here. Okay, so that's your first partial that you needed here. Now you go on to do your second partial, which is this one. So for it, uh, this is the sigmoid function itself, right? So you need to know uh, that that sigmoid function answer, by the way, is the A, right? Or, or it's the A. Uh, uh, yeah, it's the A, which is also out. Okay. So the sigmoid, remember, is going to the the output from it is going to be called A or out or output, right? Okay. So that means when we want to take the partial of a second quantity we're looking at is the partial of out with respect to Z, right? For out with respect to Z, that means we are asking for the partial of sigmoid with respect to Z. That is simply partial of sigmoid with respect to Z. It turns out is because again, it was cleverly chosen. Uh, the sigmoid function was cleverly chosen because its partial derivative answer is simply sigmoid times one minus sigmoid. Now, to verify that step is a long calculus thing. And you need to go to this link over here to see why the derivative is indeed that, okay? Again, I recommend if you're uh, either a calculus buff and so you want more practice in calculus and so on, or you really want to know how everything is working here and why it's why that's the partial derivative, then you should go to that link, pull it up and look at why. So it's slightly complicated, too complicated for me to present it here, but you should work it out there if you, if you have time. And that way you'll verify that that is the partial equation, okay? So what that means is that now in our case, uh, we're now ready to plug in the values for the sigmoid, right? Our sigmoid answer was a 0.8796. So we plug it in 0.8796 times one minus 0.8796. We just got our second quantity here. We just got the second quantity, okay? So we got the red quantity and we got the blue quantity, right? Now we simply have to do this last quantity of the black one, okay? So that we go down to here, and we realize that uh, dz with respect, to, with respect to w7, this is the equation for the z that we used. We computed z from this. Okay, we computed z from that, that highlighted formula. Okay, so now we are asking for the partial of that highlighted formula with respect to W7. Well, it turns out these terms will disappear because they don't have W7 in them. The only thing that remains is the A1, right? And A1, we already know, was whatever answer we had computed here. So that was 0.9995. So that's our third partial quantity in here. And now we have all three quantities that we need, all three quantities that we need. And now we're ready to multiply them all out and get this final answer. And that is this number here. This is the final answer, okay? So now we're ready to uh, take that final answer and multiply it by the learning rate and update our weight, right? So the learning rate we said we chose it to be 0.1. And so you multiply that quantity by the learning rate, multiply, multiply by the learning rate. The original weight was 0.04. That was the way it was when you started out, when you ran the whole thing, it was point, uh, point, uh, 0 0.4, right? It was 0 0.4. So now after updating it, it becomes 0 0.40127.
So it got modified by this 0 0.0127 quantity. Okay, it got changed by that amount. Okay. Now you similarly will do the calculations for the partial with respect to W1, right? So you have that long chain that I showed you here a minute ago. The chain of five, right? Oh, maybe it's actually coming up later, I'm sorry. Maybe I went too far down, sorry, I went in the wrong direction. I have to go find it. It's a chain of five quantities. And they are right here. Okay. So I will similarly go back and I'll compute each one of these quantities very carefully. And so I go through the calculations here to get it all happening, right? All of it, all of it very carefully. And that leads to the final answer. of uh, this quantity here. So now I take that quantity my final final quantity will be uh, this quantity here, okay? So that's my final quantity. I take that quantity multiplied by the learning rate and my original weight was 0.2 and now I modify it and I get a new weight. But notice how it's changing in like the seventh decimal place and so on, right? Not too early, right? Because you're making very, very tiny changes, okay? So of course, uh, this shows the importance of you know high precision calculations. You need lots of decimal places for this thing to work correctly. Uh, so once you do it, uh, these are your new updates now. These two bluey things are your two new weights. And when you rerun the whole network all over again, you'll find this answer creeps a little bit closer to one, which is what you wanted to do, right? You want it to do because once it gets closer to one, the next time it'll get even closer to one, next time even closer to one and so on. And what you want to be careful about is that you never pick your learning rate too high so that you jumped around like this. So you want it to stabilize down at the bottom here, which is the perfect answer is one, right? Close to one and then stop. But if you jumped around too much, if you went down too much, you might overshoot the one and hit in the other direction. Then you're hitting the wrong direction. Then you have to bounce back and so on. And this is a big learning rate. So this is showing you how your error surface that you're trying to navigate through is something like this. And you're trying to gradiently descend it. You're trying to go downhill into the little valley and stop when you hit the valley, right? You don't want to overshoot it because if you overshoot it, then you'll start bouncing around looking for it and you'll miss it, right? So that's the reason why you want your steps to be small, but also not so small as we were just speaking about in the last half an hour where you're smaller than the machine error itself in calculations, right? Okay. I, I got a quick question. Go ahead. So I, I know you said you don't want to um, overtrain on like one image or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're starting with random weights, couldn't you like fit to that one image? And then maybe that would be faster to train others after that or is that um, just there's a, all sorts of good ideas like that people have lots of things they have pre-trained weights and then they do further further refinement and so on yeah in this whole game uh there's so many different things you can try because it's it's such a big huge moving machine with parts you tweak one part here you tweak one part there sometimes people don't even know what really helps them so they have to be very careful in figuring out which tweak really helps them out the most right so all of those things are correct, okay? There's lots and lots of ideas, but the bad news is that all of these ideas are worthless today because most of them will only give you small, tiny improvements. And the big improvements are not gonna come from those kinds of tweaks. The big improvements are gonna come from 
thinking of what correct loss function to use or how to redesign the experiment so that it's comparing the right things and so on, okay? So uh, there's different levels to be aware of how to make improvements and you're thinking about, you have a good sort of thinking outside the box type mentality and that's important, uh, but you'll see that in the big picture, there'll be so many things that you can be thinking about in this game and some things will end up being more important than others, right? So definitely you will wait to see more of those actual concrete examples uh, that now I know you've taken Dr. Rawat already, is that correct? Uh, you were in his class, right? So- Yeah, that's correct. So you may have already seen, I don't know if he did the GAN and all these things in the class or not. I don't know how much of that he did. Uh, did he do the, 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 the generative adversarial networks and all that? Uh, he, he mentioned it. He didn't really go into detail. On okay. It. Okay, fine. But I know he'll be talking about that in a couple of days when he talks to you guys on Monday. I think he's talking to you guys about that. Uh, or Monday or Tuesday. So you'll see very complicated structures putting all these things together. And the smartness comes from making a new complicated structure or thinking about what's going wrong with your system, right? And making it work correctly, okay? So that'll be the gain. And of course, all these other things that you're talking about are also important, but maybe the benefits from them are not that big a deal, right? Uh, okay, so that's, that's the main story. Um, beyond that, uh, the rest of this just goes through giving you some further calculation answers if you wanted to do some extra work on your own. Uh, which I don't recommend you do right now. In fact, if anything, I would recommend that you go and watch more videos from last year now, uh, before tomorrow and before the day after and so on. Uh, go do all those things. And then of course you may get some programming work from Robert later on this evening. Uh, but anyway, here it's, uh, it's, it's given you some other correct answers for the updates, uh, which you would pursue independently by going through those calculations, right? Meaning you'd have to figure out, you know, uh, W8 is this one here and W2. So W8 and W2 means you're looking at this pathway here. See, we just finished looking at this pathway on top, the topmost pathway. And now you're taking the next level of pathway and it's got W2 and W8 in there. And we're giving you the correct answers if you wanted to go figure it out by yourself and make it happen. It's not that important if you do it or not, but of course it's up to you, right? Okay. So uh, that's more or less than where we are done today with this material. Now, what's gonna happen next time is uh, I will come back tomorrow and talk to you now about how all this gets put into a massive, bigger system that is actually able to, uh, that is actually able to, uh, to handle things like pictures and videos and so on, right? And uh, looking at, but it's all based on this these basic ideas that you're seeing here, right? So you want to firstly make sure that you don't leave the end of today without reviewing this material so that you understand these basic ideas. And then you want to get ready for tomorrow uh, by looking at some other videos and so on. And then tomorrow we'll come and we'll talk about what is specifically called the convolutional neural network. So what I did for you so far, nobody would call it a convolutional neural network, even though it is doing convolution in that sense, uh, because it's doing the dot product between two vectors, right? And that first step. But when they mean convolutional neural networks, they explicitly mean these two dimensional ones, like uh, full arrays, full tables, full two dimensional tables, not one dimensional vectors, full two dimensional tables of things in the way that we were doing convolution this morning, right? We'll talk about it that way. And so it'll basically be employing these ideas to make everything work. But in the end, it's able to handle complete pictures and so on and uh, assign meaning to those pictures, different class names and all that. So for example, your pictures could be pictures of, you know, 10 categories of objects and you wanna know which category of object it is. And so your final output might just be a, an answer digit. The answer digit could be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero, right? For the 10 classes. 
So your training would be you'd show a picture of one object and you'd want your digit to be number seven, maybe your answer output to be number seven. Or you'd train a certain something and you'd want your output to be number six because that's the object category that this is or whatever, right? So that's what these convolutional neural networks are going to let you do. And I will be talking about that tomorrow then, okay? Um, so let me see where I am in terms of the schedule and so on for today. I think this was more or less where we were supposed to get to. Is that correct, people? Do, do you guys remember any of this? I think so, yeah. The, uh, the schedule uh, said we were doing SVMs too, I think. Right, um, that's in the list. Uh, I'm going to skip them for now. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick overview of SVMs uh, just for now for five minutes or so, but I don't want to get into too much detail about it, partly because it is a little bit of a, of a different direction for thinking about all this. But on the other hand, it's also a similar direction, right? Because what I tried to tell you earlier today with the two versions of, new, of, of machine learning that you've seen so far, you saw the basic neural networks that we ended up in great detail right now. And you saw the boosting one this morning in some amount of great detail. Uh, and what you got a sense was that both of them employed this convolution or dot product or scalar product of two vectors, right? Do you all agree on that concept is that that's what you should be thinking about in the similarity between those two approaches? Yes? Yes. Okay, and the only issue is how are the final weights discovered, right? That in the, in the boosting one, you're choosing from a menu or a banquet of possible choices, meaning all the choices are being presented to you up front, and you are going to select components of those choices and the components will make up the final choice, right? The components as they fit together, each expert as it fits together with other experts will make up the final weighting that you're using, right? Uh, in, in neural networks, you're starting with something wrong and using the learning process to uh, correct, 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 correct until you get it right, okay? Now in SVMs, uh, the game is different in how you start defining the problem, right? Uh, so what you talk about is you talk about, uh, so maybe I'll actually give you some presentation from it just to because you asked about it, right? But I'll only spend like five minutes on it, okay? I, I don't wanna spend too much time. Uh, but I see I'm supposed to be ending sometime at the three o'clock, 3.30ish point, between three and 3.30, right? So I plan to end about 10 minutes from now, okay? So let me uh, take you to that spot then, the support vector machines. A uh, quick question before we move on. Yeah, go on. Um, so when we were talking about gradient descent and how you can accidentally like skip over like the lowest point, would that mean that like there is some optimal learning rate such that you will find the best possible accuracy and that you kind of have to like guess and check? Yeah, I think it's not. Uh, it's not like it's uh, an optimal and therefore de determinable rate. I think you have to kind of trial and error get it. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Now, generally what people do is they'll set it up so that once the error starts growing, you'll just quit, right? That, right, that means yeah. somewhere early. That means somewhere earlier you had the right answer. You should take one of those answers, right? Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, okay? Uh, just let me quickly talk about this whole story with the SVM. So imagine you are dealing with the case of uh, two classes only, right? You have faces and trees, okay? So a person's face here and a bunch of tree images here, right? Now you're starting, image size might be 120 by 120. So you could scale it down to be smaller and smaller and smaller, right? And you could go down all the way down to a very tiny number, okay? You could keep scaling it. Ultimately, it's only two by two, right? You come down, come down, come down. Now, two by two, and then you could do one more scaling to get it to two by one. Two by one means you took each face and you converted each face into only two numbers, okay? Just by scaling down, right? By downscaling, okay? Similarly, you took each tree image and you downscale it down to only two numbers, okay? Now, because they're two numbers, you can now plot them as X and Y on a, on a, on a plot, right? On a, on, a, on a regular plane, right? You can plot them, okay? So 
that's where I'm going next. So when you plot them on a plane, uh, in this set of slides, we are showing them to you as, so this is your two dimensional plot, one axis, the other axis, right? X axis and Y axis. So all your faces might've ended up around here. Remember each one of your faces was converted to a two point, to a two point piece of data, right? And each one of your non faces was converted to a two point piece of data. Now you're taking each one of those points and plotting them in a 2D plane, right? Okay, which, which I take it you, you, you all understand how I did that? How I took my two point data and plotted it here. Do you understand that? Uh, sorry, I'm a little bit confused about that. Okay, so let's start from the beginning again. Let's go to that previous slide, right? And the previous slide said, I have my database of faces and I have my database of trees, right? I'm only dealing with two classes like that, okay? Faces and trees, not, not faces and everything else, right? Okay, so I'm going to convert oh, each professor. one. Sorry, go on. Uh, 120 by 120 is the size of the image or the size of the data set? Or... No, it's the size of my image. Okay. Each, each picture in my data set is 120 by 120. Okay. And so I'm downscaling. And downscaling means simply subsampling and getting smaller, right? So I went from 120 by 120 to 60 by 60. And then I went from 60 by 60 to 30 by 30. And then I went from 30 by 30 all the way down, down, down. I keep going lower and lower by whatever scale factor that brings me down to two by two. And then finally two by two is still square. I don't want it to be square. I want it to be only uh, two by two means I have four numbers for each image, right? I have four numbers for a face and four numbers for a tree. I don't like that. I only want two numbers out of this problem. So I do one more scaling in only one dimension and I get it down to a set of two numbers, right? So did you understand that part first, how I took each face and converted it just to a very tiny piece of two numbers. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I did the same for each tree, right? Converted it to a set of two numbers, okay? Now I take those two numbers, right? Because those two numbers are like a pair of X and Y values, right? So I can now plot each one. Remember each face is two numbers now and each tree is two numbers, right? So I can take each one of those and I can plot it on a plot like this, right? And I will find that all of my faces will be clustering on one area because faces have something in common, right? So their two numbers will look like similar things. And the trees two numbers will look like similar things and they should be somewhat different from each other. Meaning I should not get a lot of confusion. I should not get a lot of salt and pepper behavior where everything is interspersed between trees and, and faces, okay? I should not get that, right? because I know that they're different things, right? Trees and faces are different. So even though I scale them down to two numbers, those two numbers for faces should be different from the two numbers I got for trees, okay? So the point is, of course, we're only doing this to visualize. We're never gonna do this calculation this way. We're only doing this so you get a sense of how to visualize this problem, right? Now, the point is once you've done that, the two sets that way, what you're really looking for is a partition, a partition line that will help you then in the future, you're given a 120 by 120 image and you're asked, is it a face or is it a tree, right? You only allow those two categories. You're not talking about cars and cell phones and walls and all that, not allowed. Only images of trees and images of faces, okay? So somebody gives you a 120, 120 image face or 120, 120 tree thing. You go down, you break it down, you cut it down to these two numbers going to that scaling down thing and you plonk it on one of these two sides, right? And depending on which side it falls, you're gonna call it that side. You're gonna say, if it falls on this side, you're gonna call it a tree. And if it falls on this side, you're gonna call it a face, right? So that's why you wanna have this partition. You wanna know what this partition is, okay? You wanna know what this line is. Now it turns out really quickly that that line, you have many, for the way that I've shown my data to you here, my trees are here and my faces are here. For the way that I've shown it to you, there are many options for that partition line, okay? Many, many, many orientations of the line. So all of these are valid uh, partitions, right? All of them are. But it turns out there's only one that is the best such partition and it gives me the maximum fattest margin for error. 
So the notion of margin becomes important. That yellow band that I have here is important now. The broadness of that yellow band. So I want the broadest band. I want that black line that sits in the broadest yellow band that is in between the two classes of data. Do you understand that basic point? Okay. Now that idea of finding a separator, once I find a separator, then I can do my classification. Right? You'll give me another image. I'll convert it just to two, two, two numbers. I'll see which set of, the, of this yellow bar my two numbers are on, and I'll call it that class, right? So it turns out, uh, believe it or not, the surprising thing is that the calculation of that yellow bar shape, what the equation for that yellow bar is, the calculation for it turns out only depends on the two closest teams of warring factions. Who are the warring factions? The warring factions are, now, by the way, I never went through this this morning telling you, uh, you know, this morning we were talking about faces and non-faces, right? I never had time to tell you about what is a face that doesn't look like a face. What is a face that really looks like a non-face? And what is a non-face that looks like a face? Can you guys just think really quickly what those might be? Maybe animal faces? No, 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 we're dealing with real humans here. No animals in the code. Do you mean like false positives? Yeah, yeah, we want to know, but what is a concrete example I'm asking you, right? Like it could be like a, a shadow that looks like a face. Is yeah, so a shadow may happen. You might have seen that in your life. I don't know if you really did or not. Uh, I have one picture, which I'll promise to try to look up to show you tomorrow. It's a picture in a rock, right? It's, 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 it's actually a class photograph for a class crowd, you know, some graduating class, but they're taking it against a Princeton-like background building. And you know how Princeton buildings are like those rocky kind of walls and so on. One of the patterns in the rock accidentally just looks like a perfect face. Okay, nobody sculpted it or anything. If you looked at it without somebody telling you a face, you'd never spot it as a face. But once somebody told you there's a face, they encircled it like a face, you'll never fail to see that it is a face shape in the rock, right? So that would be a case of a false positive, meaning every algorithm will give you that there's a face there. But we know it's not a face, it's just a pattern in the rock, right? And of course, people have done this kind of thing. They see, you know, some Christian types see Blessed Virgin Mary and building window panes and all that, whatever, you know, and then there's people that have seen the man in the moon face. They say the moon sometimes looks like a human face and so on. Okay, so whatever. And you said, what did you say? You said smoke or what did you tell me? What, what did you actually tell me? Shadows. Shadows, shadows, yeah. So, so shadows and so on. Okay, so that's that. Then what about the other way around? When is a human face not looking like a human face? Whose would that be? If you have like face paint or something? Well, face paint isn't, because that's like a fake face. I mean, I'm talking about a real natural face. The poor person has no control over it, right? So that would be a disfigured face or something, right? Like some people, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen somebody with their nose cut off and so on, or a massive modification of their, their lips and so on, you know, whatever. What about, what about eyes closed? Eyes closed are not major problems because these algorithms okay. are pretty good at finding closed eyes. But I'm talking about a real disfigurement of the face, you know? Um, and, and as a joke, I've always told people in the past that I always thought Mick Jagger was somebody whose face wouldn't pass a face detection algorithm because it seems like his face had lost all shape over the years of doing drugs and sun and all that. Uh, but, but anyway, then I went and looked at his face as a young person before he did drugs and he also had a disfigured face. So I don't use Mick Jagger anymore in my story, right? Uh, but anyway, so there are people with faces that just don't look like a normal human face, okay? Uh, so whatever, so these are the, the, the ones that are in this case, this would be a face that is very, or a, a non-face that is very close to the face world. And these would be the faces over here that are very close to the non-face world, right? Do you see the point of why these are like the warring? These are like the two battleground, the members of the battleground team, right? All right here, right? Battleground are the ones which come too close to the other side. So you can easily mistake them for the other side, right? Okay. So it turns out this yellow bar here is mathematically totally definable only based on these closest warring members and has no mathematical definition based on these faraway ones over here 
or the faraway ones over here. Do you, do you see what that means? What that means is that that partition is only dependent on where the confusion is and not in the areas where there's no confusion. Because if your face came from out here, then it's so far away from the margin, there's no way any, any, any classification algorithm like this is gonna make a mistake and say it's a non-face, right? And if your non-face came from out here, far away from the warring zone, there's not gonna be any confusion, right? It's only when it's in this confusing area that it might get confused and tell you the wrong answer, right? Okay, so because this pattern depends on only these input vectors here in the warring zone, these input vectors are called support vectors. They are the support vectors for this classification hyperplane, which is a line in two space, it's a line. In three space, it's a 2D plane in bigger dimensional space, which real problems are in, it's a hyperplane, okay? So you're putting a slashing plane through that high dimensional space, and you're trying to say who lies on one side of it, who lies on the other side of it. And the mathematical definition for that hyperplane is only dependent on the closest members, then those members are called support vectors, okay? So that's what support vector, then the only reason they call it machine is because the mathematicians always like to call complicated algorithms, machines or programs and all that, even though everything they do is a machine and a program in that sense. But certain times when they know that it has commercial application, they call it a machine or a program. Okay, I'll go into that more later on in a casual moment some other time. Uh, so that's support vector machine, okay? Now the point is, what does that have to do with us, right? So it turns out the way that you compute those guys, the equation for that thing is by taking dot products between all of these all of these support vectors here and the new quantity that you're testing. The new quantity that you came in with, you wanna to test to see, is it lying on this side of the plane or is it lying on this side of the plane? It turns out what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna be computing dot products between uh, that new number that you came, that new pair of points that you came, pair of numbers that you came up with, right? So somebody give you a pair of numbers and said, tell me which side of the plane it's on, right? You're gonna compute a dot product between it and each one of these, and you're gonna add them up and do something complicated. And so in that sense, again, it turns out that this dot product idea is so important. This weighted sum is so important, right? But in this problems approach, where are these weights, weights coming from? So you, so you got your new pair of numbers that constitute a new picture, right? Two numbers constitutes the picture. You got that new pair of numbers. Who are the weights that you're multiplying that, that pair of numbers by? The weights of each support vector? Correct. The, the values of each support, the, 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 the quantities in each support vector, right? Correct, that's correct. So you can think about it as though, you know, when you do that, that you already saw this earlier. Somebody mentioned it earlier. They said, oh, is it that the dot product gives me a high value when the two things are similar, right? Somebody asked me that earlier, right? You said, when you were looking at the I pattern and all that, somebody said, is it that the, in Adaboost, is it that that expert is looking for the I-like pattern in the image? And the answer is, is somewhat true, that you get a high value when the convolution pattern that you're using matches the picture pattern, right? So here you can think of it as something similar going on, right? You came up with a new test for me. I'm gonna dot product with all of these battling crowd over here, and I'm gonna be pulled over to the side which wins the battle, right? You see that point? So I guess you would determine which one wins by like where it points in relation to the um, the partition line? Correct, correct. I mean, you're pulled over to one side of the partition line by that calculation which involves dot products, okay? And the dot products are, for, are each of the members. So the only point I'm trying to make here is that uh, since we're talking about always coming in with a test example and we have to dot product with, with some weights, right? In neural networks, the weights are decided by learning experience a billion times. In Adaboost, they are determined by uh, 
by choosing from a menu of buffets and so on, right? In these support vector machines, it looks like they're being chosen by the battling team. Okay, and that's how the weights are chosen. But that's the only reason I do I include all these together, right? To talk about. But today I thought I wouldn't spend too much time on the support vector machine because it is a little bit of a detour for you. A little bit off the beaten track. The quicker you get into neural network stuff and think about it deeply and start reading papers and all on it, the better for you. In the summer project, you're unlikely to be seeing anything with support vector machines, even though it's good to know about what I just told you, right? Okay. So people, that's it for the day. Are you all happy right now? You all feel contented? You know a lot about machine learning at this point. Do you feel happy? I, I think I do. Um, I have one more question, though. Unless someone else has one more. I only have time for one more, because then I have to let Robert take over. So go on. OK. Um, so given that it obviously the dot product tells you which side of the line you land on, how does that work? Or like, what's the reconcile with the fact that a dot product gives you like a single number? No, that single number is going to have a positive value and a negative value, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what that side of the line is. Oh, OK. The positive answers on one side, negative answers on the other side. Okay. OK. OK, so what you're really doing is you're not really, uh, you're really generating a perpendicular to this line, right? And I don't know if you know enough about dot products, but when you take a dot product, uh, and you and you shadow it onto that perpendicular line, whether you fall going to the left of the line or to the right of the line will be positive or negative, okay? Do you know enough about dot products? Uh, I use them a few times, yeah. Okay, but think about that shadowing thing, right? Like mm -hmm. if, 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 my, if, if I'm taking a dot product of something on the x-axis, right? Then if it's oriented to the right of the 12 in the clock, then the dot product will be positive, right? If it's mm -hmm. oriented to the left of the 12 on the clock, then the dot product is going to be negative, right? Oh, so okay, that, that makes sense, okay. That's the same idea going on here. It's saying, which side are you leaning towards? Are you leaning towards this team or are you leaning towards that team, okay? Okay, okay but people, that works. I should let Robert go. Uh, Robert, are you here? Okay. I'm here. Okay, well, great, Robert. So you take over now, right? I believe you're on the clock. Is that right? That is Robert. correct. Okay, people, I'll say bye. I'll see you guys tomorrow, okay? But whatever time I'm supposed to come on. Bye. Bye, Robert. Thank you, Dr. Lobo. Bye. Thank you guys, David. Thank bye. you so much. Yeah, I thank you guys, David. Bye. Bye, bye, bye.